Okay, shall we start? Okay, then welcome to everybody to this second uh, part of the session on experimental gravitation. Uh, the first speaker is Dennis Philip from the University of Bremen, and he is talking about geodesy. I think you are able to share the screen. Yes, perfect. Hopefully. So uh, I hope that you can see the slides now. Yes, yeah, perfect. Okay, Thank you. perfect. Uh, hopefully you also see this little red pointer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Ah, okay, yes. that's nice. Um, okay, so my, my talk is on geodesy, actually on height measures in geodesy. And not only will I discuss so-called conventional geodesy, but I will discuss relativistic geodesy. So how all that um, conventional geodetic notions we encounter when we discuss what a height measure actually is can, can be lifted to the framework of relativistic gravity, that is GR for our purpose here. This is joint work with uh, Huvu and Jürgen Müller from the Institute of Geodesy from Leibniz University of Hanover and Eva Hackmann and Klaus Lemmetzal from, from Bremen. So then let's get started right away with explaining what all these terms in the title mean. And uh, I think one should start with explaining what geodesy actually is. And here you can see my, my favorite quote of uh, the, the definition of geodesy from a famous geodesist uh, who's called Helmut, Helmut Moritz. And he said that geodesy is what geodesists do for their living. Obviously, that's true. But if you're not satisfied with this explanation, we might have a look into a modern textbook, for example, the one by Torge and Müller. And there it is defined that the objective of geodesy is to determine the figure and the external gravity field of the Earth. And then as well its orientation in space, or that as a function of time, and you do measurements on the Earth's surface and exterior to it. So geodesy then might be described as the science of the properties and the gravity field of the Earth, and in my understanding it's an overlap of engineering and physics. And certainly there are important links to other fields such as positioning and navigation, so all these global navigation satellite systems belong to the field of geodesy, and there's important links to environmental science and uh, climate research. And all this conventional geodesy builds on Newtonian gravity. So that's my definition of conventional geodesy. It is uh, whenever Newtonian notions are used. And as we will find out, the gravitational potential is one of the central notions in this field. And everything else is then logical conclusion and, and mathematical theorems based on this quantity. And maybe the most famous um, space mission from the field of geodesy is the GRACE mission. So GRACE stands for, uh, let me see, gravity recovery and uh, climate experiment. I think that is, that's, that's the acronym. And it consists of two satellites in orbit for about 15 years. The satellites follow each other on a polar orbit um, around the Earth. And they measure and track the change of their separation. And what you have then essentially is a map of the gravity field encoded in the temporal change of the spacecraft separation. So you can measure the Newtonian gravity field or you can measure the gravity field with this. We have not discussed yet how to, how to model it. And maybe the most famous outcome of this mission is the observation of the ice mass loss in the region of Greenland. And from the gravity signal observing the spacecraft separation change over time, it was deduced that there are about 281 gigatons of ice mass lost in Greenland every year. So this is almost one gigaton of ice mass lost on a daily basis. And just to remind you, a gigaton of ice mass is a cube of ice with one kilometer edge length. So this is melting almost on a daily basis. And we can observe that in the changing gravity field from space at an altitude of about 400 kilometers at low Earth orbits. Um, which these uh, geodetic satellite missions usually use. And uh, so that, that's the context, that's the field of geodesy, that's what geodesists uh, care about. And certainly for, for geodesy and all the related fields, actually for all the observations that we do, reference systems are important to describe these observations. So we need to set up reference systems and to do so we need special reference surfaces and one reference surface that is of particular interest is a height reference surface. So this is what you have as a common understanding of height above sea level. So you define some kind of reference surface that you call sea level and you introduce a notion of height which is referred to this reference surface. As we will find in a minute, this height reference surface 
surfaces are intimately related to the properties of the gravity field. And then you can do a height definition in terms of so-called geopotential numbers. We will make sense of that in a minute. And this, from a theoretical point of view, you might say a de definition such as this can be considered to be fundamental. Well, then we introduce a relativistic theory of gravity, so for example, GR, and this requires us to reformulate all, all the basic geodetic notions we have been used to before, and to redevelop a consistent theoretical framework, which we call relativistic geodesy, to describe and interpret all the measurements we do, the, the contemporary high precision measurements, and also be ready for future, even higher precision measurements. And as we all know, in, in GR, the gravity field has many more degrees of freedom as compared to the Newtonian situation. So this needs to be analyzed carefully and the implications for geodesy need to be worked out. And then with a relativistic theory of gravity such as GR, you can start a field uh, which is called chronometric geodesy that builds on the comparison of clocks and that gives you insight into the space-time geometry if you have the solid theoretical formulation of the observables that you do. So the, the comparison of two clocks in GR, for example, and then um, inferring their separation from uh, redshift measurements. And as I will try to convince you today, a genuine relativistic definition of height is possible in analogy to the Newtonian understanding. So we will go along the same way, just generalize uh, notions, lift them to GR and make sense of them again. So just to set the stage, Newtonian geodesy. What's the central object? Well, it's Newtonian gravitational potential u. There's a field equation and the acceleration is given as a minus for conventional reasons. The gradient of the potential. Um, in geodesy, you find as its distinction between gravity and gravitation. Gravitation is described by the gravitational potential u. Gravity is formulated by adding centrifugal effects, which we as observers on the rotating Earth, rigidly co-rotating with the Earth, experience as well. So then we add the centrifugal potential to the gravitational one, and we define the so-called gravity potential W. Well, then the acceleration that we measure on the Earth's surface is minus the gradient of this potential W, and there's scalar gravity, which is then the norm of this acceleration. As you know, we can expand the Newtonian gravitational potential in a spherical harmonic expansion with suitable boundary conditions so it has to bench at infinity and so on. So we take this family of solution to the Laplace equation, expand it in terms of multiple coefficients CLM and SLM, and these are the actual observables in missions such as this GRACE mission that I've just introduced. So that's, that's the stage we need to set. And um, now we can discuss reference surfaces that we need to define a suitable height measure in this Newtonian framework. So as I said, a particular reference surface of interest is a height reference. To define such a height reference, uh, what's usually done is we define the Earth's geoid as one level surface of this gravity potential W. And we say that this level surface shall coincide best in some least square sense with mean sea level. So the level surface is just given by W being some constant W naught. W naught is agreed upon value, which is positive. So that's where the minus sign comes from. However, it's just a level surface with a value that we all need to agree, agree upon. It might be a, compli a complicated shape. So we might introduce a simpler mathematical description. For example, we can introduce a perfect biaxial ellipsoid of revolution, which then is a best fit to this geoid level surface. This is a geometrical concept, of course. You describe it by two parameters, like semi-major and minor axis, or flattening and eccentricity, and so on. And it's just the best fit to this geoid level surface. And then you can define so-called normal gravity by an artificial gravity potential Wn. You just assume that this reference ellipsoid, this, this best fit ellipsoid, is a level surface of uh, this artificial gravity potential and you prescribe the full mass of the Earth and its rotational frequency, and then it all works out. You can uniquely determine what this artificial gravity potential, the so-called normal potential is. Okay, now we can use all that to discuss what height actually is and, and what we understand by height. So if you look up what height means, well, Wikipedia is where you usually look up things first nowadays. So you, you try to search for height and you find that height is a measure of vertical distance. 
very well. So then we have to define what the vertical distance is. So we have to define the vertical direction. This is the plumb line usually, so the direction of the local acceleration. Well, and distance, that means you integrate from some chosen reference surface, for example. So um, using this, we can define the so-called autometric height of a point P. It works as follows. So that's just simple. We integrate the W between two points. You know that this W2 minus W1. You can also write that integral as g dn, where g is a scalar acceleration, and uh, n gives you the, the direction in which you integrate. You know that the closed loop integral of g dn has to vanish, whereas the closed loop integral of dn does not vanish. OK, very well. Now we integrate g dn from a point p naught, which we put on this geoid that we just defined to a point p. Well, it's simple. That's wp minus wp naught. And then taking care of all the signs, eventually we can write that as W naught, which is positive, minus the absolute value of WP, just to be clear of all signs. And this is called geopotential number, CP, geopotential number of point P. And now we introduce automatic height, HP, as CP divided by G bar, where G bar is the average acceleration along the plumb line integrated from the GRE to point P. This is what usually is meant as height in geodesy. This is height above mean sea level that you encounter. You can define something similar, which is called normal heights, and you construct them in an uh, analog way. But instead of using the gravity potential W, you use this normal gravity potential Wn, which was built on this reference ellipsoid we defined before. So this is height measures in geodesy. And then, Eventually, now we find that height measures between stationary clocks on or close to the Earth's surface at first order can be related to the redshift of the clocks. That starts the field of chronometric geodesy. So we will come back to this in a couple of slides again. We know that we know that if the theory of gravity is not described by Newtonians, uh, Newtonian gravity, there, there is GR, which has uh, well, subtle and not so subtle consequences. So for example, many more degrees of freedom that are introduced, uh, space time is curved and all that. So make sense of all the aforementioned in a relativistic theory of gravity now. And then you could say that this is the field of relativistic geodesy, which is actually the physics of a time-like killing vector field. So that's the framework, that's how it works. We assume that there exists a time-like killing vector field and we model the earth by an isometric, so that's a killing congruence in GR. That's our model of the earth, the constituents of the earth and all the observers rigidly attached to the surface, they move on this isometric congruence. You can encode the degrees of freedom into two potentials and the spatial metric. So you can write up a potential for the gravitoelectric effects, one for the gravitomagnetic effects, and then you're left with the spatial metric. And you find that rigidly co-rotating observers on the surface of the Earth, they all agree on a time-independent redshift potential. And in this congruence of observers on the Earth, then you find that the redshift between any two clocks in the congruence is determined by this redshift potential. We can use all that to formulate a uh, generalization of the Newtonian potential W. This is what we call U star, a relativistic gravity potential, which we can use to formulate a relativistic version of the Earth's geoid by a level surface, again, of this potential. So how does it work mathematically? In adapted coordinates, this is the metric we use. We uh, set up the time by killing vector field such that this is simply d by dt in adapted coordinates, and then we have some gravitoelectric part. Here is the redshift potential appearing again, which is related to the norm of the killing vector field. There is some gravitomagnetic part, which is related to the twist of the killing vector field, and you're left with the spatial metric. You can look at how the redshift is defined in GR, and you will find that, well, that's, that's the usual picture you draw, photons transmitted from one world line to second world line, transmitted with delta t, and received with delta, uh, delta tau and delta tau twiddle, so you find that the redshift simply is the scalar product of the photons uh, tangent and the observer's tangent. You evaluate this at emission and reception point, and that's the redshift. However, in a post newtonian limit, you find that the redshift is simply related to the gravity potential differences if the two clocks do not move. So if the velocities are zero, the redshift is given at first order by potential differences. 
So then we conclude from this that um, if the redshift is given by potential differences and our concept of height we introduced before was also related to potential differences, let's combine the two and we find that this notion of automatic height can be expressed at first order in terms of the redshift between two blocks. However, this is a mixed concept. We mix the Newtonian notion of height with a relativistic observable that's the clock redshift. And we can do better than this. And here's, here's how it works. Um, we use the relativistic gravity potential U star now to define what I call chronometric height, height determined with clocks. Um, it works as follows. We define generalizations of these geopotential numbers. We call them CP star, the star indicating that this is the relativistic object. And we essentially define them as potential differences again, but this time we use this generalized relativistic gravity potential U star instead of the Newtonian one. And then you can uh, infer that this is related to the redshift of a particular clock that you're interested in at point P and the clock positioned on the Earth's geoid. That's where this value which defines the level surface building the Earth's geoid comes about. So this geopotential number generalizations are related to the redshift at any order. That's true at any order. And now we introduce a concept of chronometric height, HP star, by simply the quotient of this CP stars, this generalized geopotential numbers, and an average acceleration A bar. And we say that this average acceleration A bar is computed from the acceleration potential and averaged along the plumb line integrated from the relativistic geoid surface to point P of interest. And we find as well that this acceleration potential from which you compute the acceleration coincides with the redshift potential. There's only one potential that describes the redshift of clocks and the accelerations of falling corner cubes if you want. So it's all well-defined and it holds to any order. And this is um, a, an advantage as compared to this first order mixture of concepts when you mix conventional geodetic notions of height with relativistic observables such as the redshift. You could go even further and say, well, do we really need this acceleration A bar to make that generalized geopotential numbers into a height also taking care of all the units? Well, GR gives you what's called a surface gravity, for example. So you could look at, you need some acceleration to match the units, of course. So you could calculate the surface gravity at the gravitational radius of, for example, the monopolar field of the Earth. Take the Earth's mass, model it by a Schwarzschild spacetime, calculate the surface gravity at the Schwarzschild radius. Voila, that's a uniquely defined acceleration given only in the theory of GR, genuinely relativistic, not existing in Newtonian setup. And you might define a chronometric height in terms of this quotient here, generalized geopotential numbers defined in terms of the redshift potential divided by surface gravity. So that's what we can offer as a relativistic generalization of the concept of height, which is commonly used in, in geodesy. And actually, that's it. So that's what I wanted to uh, tell you about. OK, thank you very much, Dennis. Questions? Other questions? There's one, one question. What is the, so if you are comparing these various definitions and so on, what is, what are the, um, what are the numbers we are talking about? Are these meters or centimeters or millimeters or what is, uh, what is going on here? You're muted. I, I guess you mean the difference between the Newtonian height measure and this generalization. Um, and all of this is his various uh, potentials, all these various gravitational uh, yeah. things, um, uh, even in conventional geodesy. Yeah, well, in, in conventional geodesy, that's on the order of magnitude of, of centimeters. If you go from these normal heights using the normal potential to the automatic height using the true gravity potential, that's the orders of centimeters, meters roughly order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. For sure, the, the relativistic uh, piece on top of that is tiny, right? That, that's below current um, observational accuracy for heights. We know that we can use clocks at the 10 to minus 18, 10 to minus 19 level to measure height differences at the centimeter level roughly, right? So this uh, relativistic offsets, if you want, uh, smaller than this. 
But next level of measurement accuracy will give us some insight into these notions. However, we should admit that comparing Newtonian notions and relativistic notions is a bit tricky, right? It, it, it's subtle, they live in different spaces. So diff different manifolds, how do you compare objects living, living on different manifolds? Um, so that, that's an issue. Um, and depending on what, what message you want to uh, bring about, uh, you can make the comparison to, to suit your needs, of course. Um, so for example, the, we, we published a paper on, on the relativistic geoid, and there you see it's millimeter differences between the relativistic and the Newtonian concept. And uh, yeah, that, that's the order of magnitude. So it's one over C square effects at first order. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Not then, thank you again for your talk. And we uh, go on with David. Uh, please share your screen and you're yes. talking about Thank you. the Citro G experiment. So do you, do you see my screen? Testing metric and non-metric series. You should be able to share the, yeah, it can be seen. Very good, perfect. Okay, yeah. okay. So please. So David is giving the talk. Yes, I have some problem with, okay. Oh, okay. So thank you so much. Um, let's, let's start from the summary. So I will first introduce this new experiment. Uh, so the theoretical and experimental framework uh, to which we are interested. And then um, the main goals of our uh, measurements and some preliminary results. And then I will discuss the, um, the analysis of the orbital residuals. So this is a new experiment funded by the National Institute for Nuclear Physics. And we aim at testing gravitations, let's say behind, beyond the prediction of Einstein theory in its weak field as low motion limit and possibly searching for effects foreseen by uh, alternative theories of gravitation and possibly connect with new physics. And um, Sator G builds on the improved dynamical model of the two Legios and Lares satellites, which are our test masses, uh, achieved within the previous experiment, Larase. And these improvements concern mainly the modeling of both gravitational and non-gravitational perturbations. Here are the main, mean orbital elements of the two Legios and Lares satellites. Uh, these are well-known satellites. What is important to, to stress is, is that these satellites are characterized by a very small uh, ratio of their area to mass in order to minimize the non-gravitational perturbations. Um, of course, the starting point is Einstein equivalence principle because GR is a metric theory of gravity. Uh, so uh, it is made in its modern view by three parts the weak equivalence principle that is, let's say, simply the university of free fall. And then we have local Lorentz invariance, local position invariance. That is, the results of an experiment are independent of the velocity of the free and falling frame, as well as on the place where and where, where and when in the universe it is uh, performed. And so uh, presently the conclusion that uh, viable theories uh, of gravity should be metrics in agreement with the equivalence principle. Um, other metric theories um, different from GR provides additional fields uh, beside the metric tensor in order to mediate the, the gravitational interaction. This may be scalar, vector, or tensor, depending on the light quantum boson by the spin of the light quantum boson, which uh, mediate the interaction. And the metric theories different from GR, space-time tells geometry, uh, space-time geometry tells mass energy how to move exactly as in GR, but mass energy tells space-time geometry how to pull in a different way. And the metric alone acts back on the mass in agreement with the equivalence principle. Of course, uh, the starting point to test the theory is by studying its post limit. So the, the, the natural framework is the PPN one developed by Kenneth Norbert and Clifford Will at the beginning of 70s. 
And so we have this 10 metric potential and corresponding 10 parameters uh, that can be tested by experiment because um, other metric theories provide uh, different values with respect to those uh, suggested, let's say, by GR. So uh, the natural framework to, to test gravitation is this one, but we will also try to apply as far as as possible uh, in this experiment, this, the approach suggested by Robert Dick more than 15 years ago, which is known as the Dick framework, which is a fairly general framework that allows to conceive an experiment not connected a priori with a given physical theory, say Newtonian or GR or another, and provides a way to analyze the results of an experiment under primary hypothesis. In the words of Thorne and Will, uh, we can summarize the three main uh, statements of Dick frameworks in two statements, which are well known. So space time is four dimensional differential manifold with each point corresponding to a physical event. And we not need a priori to have either a metric or an thin connection. And the theory must be expressed in, uh, in a way independent of the coordinate user, so covariant. The covariant form. So uh, these two statement, statements are important because they put the basic or the mathematical formalism to be employed when discussing an experiment. Then we have two very strong constraints. Uh, gravity must be associated with one or more two, as we have already seen this tensorial character. And the dynamical equation must be derivable, derivable from an invariant action principle. Finally, the last statement is a practical guiding principle and, and states simply that nature likes things as simple as possible. Now, uh, there is a close uh, link between this framework and the PPN1 because two of the conclusions reached by Dick became postulates of the PPN1. So these are the existence of one second rank tensor, the metric, and of course, the way to describe the response of matter and physics to gravity. So, uh, this by the stress energy tensor and its divergence. Moreover, in the paper by Tony Will, they remarked that it is important for the future that experimenters concentrate not only on measuring the PPN parameters, they should also perform new experiments within the Dick framework to strengthen or destroy the foundation it, lay, it lays on the PPN framework. Now, it is not easy to apply this uh, framework in every context. It is very powerful when discussing null experiments. So like in an Atwash like experiment. So when you have a torsion balance experiment or when you test uh, the equivalence principle uh, or, delineating, or it is very important in delineating the quality nature of gravity as well the covariant theories of gravity. Um, a possible attempt to apply this framework is to search for the signature of the effects of a possible theory, alternative to GR, on the orbital elements of a satellite, thus not limiting the analysis to only possible secular effects as usually done. And this approach is of considerable significance and is far from simple to push sure, and it requires a great understanding of the nature of the periodic perturbative effects that characterize the residuals of these satellites. And in this paper, we will try to discuss this aspect. Uh, our main goal, so from the analysis of the orbit of these uh, satellites, we will try to constrain a new long range interaction, uh, PPM parameters, beta, and gamma, and possibly also alpha one and alpha two related to preferred frame effects. Then we have the relativistic precession and the non-linearity of the interactions, and then ice equivalence principle and normal effect. So uh, looking to the effects on the orbital artificial satellites allowed to test GR with respect to other metrics in their deeper aspects related to curvature of space-time, motion geodesics, and field equation. What is important for us is to provide precise and accurate measurements. So in the sense of, of having at the end a robust and re reliable evaluation of all the systematic errors uh, in, in that measurement. And so we will develop um, our activities following these two main guidelines. So first of all, verify GR in, in its weekly, 
quick fill uh, slow motion limits and apply um, and look to those are not yet taken in consideration up to now from by the experiment. And this is particularly important from the non-linear linearity of the interaction. And secondly, of course, going beyond GR and looking to possible uh, other effects and the physics. Now, um, uh, last year we provided a precise and accurate measurement of the uh, relativistic length spin process on the orbits of Legios, Legios II, and Lares over a time span of about 6.5 years. So we introduced this parameter mu which is one if GR is correct uh, or zero Newtonian theory. And we measure mu, which differ by one, by one times 10 to minus three, with a, a formal error at a 95% confidence level of about seven times 10 to the minus three, and come up with uh, an evaluation of the systematic, of, of the overall systematic error of 1.6%. So we can exploit this uh, result to constrain some alternative theory of gravity, such as, as a scalar tensor theory or a torsion theory. So respectivity, respectivity a metric and non-metric theory. And scalar tensor theories uh, are um, quite interest, interested to be analyzed in, in the view of, of extended gravity. In this case, the rich scalar is replaced by a function of the Ricci scala, or also by the Ricci tensor, and also by the inclusion of a possible scalar field phi. And here we can see how the action, or if you prefer, the Lagrangian changes between the GR1 to Brunt's Dick 1, and finally to a, a general uh, extended theory of gravity. And in these cases, we have three additional effective masses, MR, M phi, and MY. And why depends on the Ricci tensor that can be tested by experiments. And if we use our error budget estimate, we can constrain this uh, additional pre precession predicted by standard gravity, which is proportional to the length theory one. So the overall precession is length theory plus this extended gravity one. And so we are able to constrain this parameter effective mass MY to this level. And consider torsion theories. These are characterized by non-symmetric affine connections. So we can build by the, using them a torsion, a new torsion S. And in this theory, we have up to 10 um, torsion parameters. Here are shown eight of these. And in this case, the precession of the right ascension of the ascending node of satellite as an additional correction to the length theory precession and an additional correction to the sitter one. 10 years ago, Mark et al. have been able to constrain this uh, linear WU2 minus WU4, this combination of torsion parameters in this, in this uh, range, exploiting a previous measurement uh, of the length theory effect with an error budget of about 10%. Now our error budget is about one, two percent, and the and the measurement is quite precise. So we are able to uh, further constrain this uh, linear combination of torsion parameters. Uh, so these two constraints uh, are to be considered, of course, preliminary. In fact, uh, they have been derived from an orbital element, the right ascension, which is subject to a secular effect, and this is very important. But uh, it is necessary before to, 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 to draw a final uh, conclusion to look to the effect, to the effects on all the orbit of these of these theories and also other possible theories. So they are they play all together. And so we do not the correct one if there is a correct one. So we need to, to analyze deeply uh, all the orbital elements. Now let's look to a, a preliminary POD that we call quasi precise orbit determination because it is not optimized. It is on 28 years. We use geodyne. The art length is seven days. We don't, we did not model GR. We did not, not estimate empirical acceleration. The quadruple coefficient was optimized with two linear trends following the, the temporal solution of this coefficient. And the state vector was adjusted 
uh, to the CD observations. Here are the residuals in the semi-major axis and in the eccentricity. This more precisely are the rate in the elements over seven days. And, and you can see they are characterized by periodic oscillations superimposed to a secular trend because here we have a negative um, average semi-major axis rate that goes to positive values. And also there is a, not, not clear here, but there is also an F, a, a secular effect in this eccentricity. These are the results for the inclination rate and the right ascension node rate. This is a very complex pattern many oscillations, and these are the results for the pericenter. Here, it is clear in a, a bias produced by Schwarzschild precession, and these oscillations are mainly due to the solar Yarkovsky shock effect. So all computer residuals uh, show both periodic and secular effects. Periodic effects have both gravitational nature, origin, and also non-gravitational origin mainly due to thermal trust effects and also to the asymmetric reflectivity of the Lagius 2. And secular effects are, of course, due to the relativistic precessions, Varsil, and steering, also the sitter, and the non-linearity of the interaction due to the relativistic J2 coefficient, and also uh, secular effects due to thermal trust effects, like the Hertz-Yarkovsky and Solar-Yarkovsky effect. The correct separation of the various periodic effects uh, represents, as said, a difficult task to achieve. Um, it represents a challenge that is nothing but simple to face, and the overcoming of which is of fundamental importance to better ver verify the uh, gravity in weak fields of motion limits. And the current periodic effects, not modeled or mismodeled in the residuals, mask the measurement of any periodic effects of a relativistic measure and constitute a kind of noise superimposed on the secular relativistic effect. This is clear in the case of our last measurement of the length theory effect. Here is the mu parameter. And these oscillations are due to the unmodeled or mismodeled periodic effects, which, however, have a Gaussian-like distribution with a hypothesis close to three and its cuteness uh, close to zero. Um, this change in the decay of the semi-major axis, which is very clear here, here in the integrated semi-major semi axis, can be explained uh, by the comparison of the solar Yarkovsky shock effect with the air Yarkovsky shock effect. This one is due to the Earth infrared radiation, while the, the first one is due to the solar radiation. And here in red, we have the semi-major axis that we derive. Uh, from the solar cost shock effect, from a, a model that we developed, and we can see that their amplitudes, uh, which they oscillate around zero bit, but with larger positive amplitudes, grows up. And this can explain the change from a decay, so from a, to a, an increase of the orbit that we observed in 2012. If we analyze the spin, the behavior of the spin of larger two, we de developed a model of the spin. These are the equatorial components, and these are the projection on the or on the along the norm along excuse me along the normal to the orbital plane and in the orbital plane here on the right. We can exclude a contribution of the Hertz Yarkovsky to this uh, change in the decay. Uh, so uh, it is quite important to analyze correctly these residuals. Here we have the values of the relativistic, relativistic precession on the argument of pericenter and on the right ascension of the ascending node. And here we computed the integrated residuals in the pericenters and compared them with the prediction of GR, which is the uh, green stripe uh, line. So even if the POD is not optimized, these preliminary results are very positive. The discrepancy is, uh, is about 2% with respect to GR predictions. We already did this measurement in the past, published on PRL and PRD. And so um, in, in that case, we obtained an evaluation of the systematic errors in the pericenter largest two of about 2%, which is an error from a sensitivity analysis of about 0.2%. Uh, 
Here, the time span was 13 years. And we were able to constrain a combination of, of gamma and beta parameters, a Yukawa-like interaction, and also two alternative theories of gravity, a torsion theory and a non-symmetric theory of gravity. In particular, the results for alpha, for a Yukawa-like potential for the strain, are quite interesting. These are uh, the results in the alpha lambda plane for our measurement and from the systematic error. And we, if we compare them with the uh, well-known uh, other tests from the laboratory scale up to the astronomical uh, one, these are composition independent experiments, we see where we are, the, 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 the range is about one hertz radi. And our results are competitive with those obtained by lunar laser ranging and radar radar ranging to, to planets. So um, we started this, uh, the activity of, of this new experiment in 2020, and we can consider it a continuation of LARASEC one. We presented the theoretical and experimental framework of this experiment. We aim at testing gravitation behind um, GR in the weak field limit and slow motion limit, uh, searching for possible effects connected with other theories of gravity. We presented these two uh, significant preliminary results. And the improvement of the dynamical model of the data reduction is underway, together with the optimization of the setup, setup uh, of, the, of, of the various models for the precise orbit determination of, the, of these three satellites. But also, we hope to consider in the future other satellites for uh, these kinds of, of measurements. So many thanks for your attention. OK, thank you very much, uh, David. Um, questions? Uh, I have a question. Please. Um, when you speak of, uh, first, uh, at the beginning, you have a very nice uh, talk. And um, when you speak about uh, uh, you show the plot of uh, axis of um, axis and the solar and Earth uh, model correction. Can you come back to the slide? Uh, sorry, the plot of the plot of uh, the axis variation and the model of our uh, solar and Earth. This before, one. The, the, before the one, the one before. Yes. This one. The semi major axis, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, why, um, uh, okay. Why the, the um, Earth and solar uh, stops at uh, uh, 5.6 uh, times to the four in the right plot? And the, the... Um, no, because in this case, the analysis was performed on a shorter time span with respect to. to to the residuals we obtained. Uh, this is in red a um, averaged uh, model for the solar Yarkovsky effect, effect. And we also developed a general model uh, for the solar Yarkovsky, the Hertz Yarkovsky effect, and also consider it the, because these effects are produced by an anisotropic temperature distribution over the satellites, which of course again produces a push. Uh, of, of the satellite, and um, and so the results of the general model are um, are in good agreement with the average of the model. Uh, we we talk about average or general model because of the uh, spin behavior, because the spin of these satellites was running very fast initially, but now they are spinning very slow. So we need to account for this for this change in the attitude in space of the satellites when we uh, develop a new model. And this model are, are, used, are used now to improve the dynamical model uh, of Geodyne, which is, uh, which is based uh, on, on, uh, on, on obsolete models now, concerning the, the thermal transforces. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we have to move on. So you can continue with the next talk on uh, on Galileo measurements, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, so this is um, a new project called Galileo for Science. And um, it, it is uh, funded by the Italian Space Agency. And 
three research centers are involved, uh, my institute, so the National Institute for Astrophysics, uh, the Politecnico in Torino, and the, of course, the, also the space agency and the Matera Laser Engine Stations. So these are the, the, the outline of the, of the talk. I will present the, the goals of this project and then um, describe the main activities in Roma. Uh, so, um, as I said, it is funded by ASI, and so uh, we will try to exploit the high eccentricity of the two satellites, GSAT-201 and 202, of the full operation capability constellation of the Galileo, and take advantage of the, of the accuracy also of the onboard atomic clocks. The, the main goals are here, a new measurement of the gravitational redshift, a measurement of the GR precession, possible constraints on dark matter in the Milky Way, and also realize a pure relativistic positioning system. Uh, this is all this, especially the first two points, are possible thanks to the large eccentricity uh, of these satellites and all the progress around this uh, wrong orbit injection were discussed this morning by Klaus. And other fundamental goals of the project are to develop new and more accurate models for the non-gravitational perturbations and to develop a new accelerometer concept for next uh, generation of Galileo satellites in order to improve the POD and also for science measurements. Now, uh, we know that special relativity and GR responsible frequency shifts on, on the onboard clocks. And so we can try to, to measure them in particular to, to, to look to the gravitational red shifts uh, and so constrain um, the possible duration or local position invariance. Um, we will try to, to work especially on the systematics, on the orbit and uh, in the other um, issues that produce systematic effects. Uh, we will develop a finite element model of the satellite and we will use also um, laser range satellite and data tracking data as normal point through rate data in order to um, improve the, the correction of the clocks and, 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 and other aspects. So uh, our goal is now to improve, to, to reach a measurement of equestrian alpha at this level, two times 10 to the minus five in order to improve, if we are able to do that, last measurement, which was performed by uh, the colleagues in uh, Brema, here we have Klaus, uh, in, uh, so by Zarm and also by the French colleagues of CFA, which have already improved the previous uh, best measurement, which is still a cornerstone gravity probe, probe A um, of the SO et al. And so um, the main systematic effects are related to temperature effects to magnetic fields, both on, on the clocks on ground and in orbit, and uh, as I said, in the orbital clock solutions. Um, the relativistic precession uh, to be considered are the well-known Svarshi, Lanthine, and the geodetic precession. Here in this table, we can compare the precession in the argument of pericenter and in the node on these two satellites in a centric orbit with a satellite in nominal orbit and also with the Legios one. So the numbers are very small. So it's very challenging, but this partial precession is large enough to be measured. And also as we have seen before to constrain a Yukawa interaction at a longer range scale comparable with this semi-measure axis of the satellite. Uh, dark matter constraints uh, arise from very light quantum fields that form macroscopic objects or clumps. And these produce topological defects. An example uh, are domain walls that if they exist, they will be responsible of glitches and transients in the clock measurements, possibly related with variation of the fundamental constants. This test was uh, already done by Roberts in collaboration in 2017, analyzing 16 years of GPS data with no, uh, with no evidence of this. Now, uh, thanks to the uh, higher performance of the clocks on the, of the Galileo, this, this test can be repeated and possibly improved. Um, this 
Topological defect may be formed during the cooling of the early universe through a spontaneous symmetry breaking phase transitions. And at the end, we are interested to their Compton wavelength, which is uh, inversely proportional to the mass of this uh, field. Um, and typically, this, this dimension is of the order of 1,000 or, or more than kilometers. So they are very big if they exist. And uh, at the end, we can look to possible uh, variation of the frequencies, which is proportional to the variation of the, of the fundamental uh, constants, like the electromagnetic fine structure constant, the ratio of light quantum mass to the quantum chromodynamics energy scale, or those related with the mass of the electron and proton. And at the end, this shift will be proportional to the um, quadratic uh, potential here. Um, relativistic positioning system, the idea is uh, based on the use of emitter fixed on the ground, equipped with uh, antenna, to provide a, a, an accurate orbit determination, which is fully relativistic, so based uh, on special and general relativity and on the concept of space-time. Traditionally, all these aspects are correction to the Newtonian approach. By the counting of the pulses of a set of different emitters, uh, whose position is known, as I said before, uh, we can provide null emission or light coordinates for the receiver on the satellite. And the measurement of the proper time interval between successive arrivals of this signal from the Earth can be used to, to localize uh, the, the receiver and then the satellite with an accuracy which at the end is controlled by the onboard clock precision. And concerning the main activities in Roma, uh, we are particularly interested in improving the non-gravitational perturbation. And among these, the solar radiation pressure, which is uh, the source of the larger systematic effect, which also uh, limit actually every uh, product which is obtained by the global navigation satellite systems. Um, and, and try to, to measure, of course, the, the, the redshift and the, the precession, the sparse precession, especially that I mentioned before, and uh, to put limit um, possibly to this alternative theory of gravity. And as I said, to uh, develop a new concept of accelerometer um, for the next Galileo, for the constellation of Galileo. Um, now, solar radiation pressure is about 10 to the minus 7 meter per square second in magnitude, and two orders of magnitude larger than the albedo and infrared radiation pressures. So our goal is to develop a finite element model that we have already developed in reality and apply a ray tracing technique to compute the effect of solar radiation pressure in premis. And we have also developed a, a box ring model um, exploiting the Galileo metadata provided by ESA. The solar radiation pressure depends on the sun flux, the distance from, of the Earth from the sun, the attitude of the spacecraft, and also by many physical properties, uh, which are also time dependent. Uh, here we have a simple model in which each surface element behaves like a linear combination of a black body, a perfect mirror, and a Lambertian diffuser. And so we are able to compute the acceleration. And we need to improve the model down to a level of acceleration of about 10 to the minus 10. And this is very hard, especially um, the main challenge is in, in the knowledge of the temperature distribution over the satellite surface. And so we need physical information characterizing the, the spacecraft. And the, ca the current um, information provided by the metadata is not enough for, for a finite element model of the satellite. So we are using a box wind. Uh, this is our uh, finite element model that we developed, uh, and it is quite similar to, to the characteristic of a real satellite. We can also improve this model further, but now we are working with a box wing. We have two box wings. One is uh, built inside console, and here we have on the right the metadata, which provides the, these optical properties mean optical properties in, in the, the visible for the for this approximation of the, of the spacecraft. 
this is a preliminary activity to also a, a ray tracing one again with console. And now I will show you the results of the numerical results for the box wing. We computed uh, the solar radiation pressure acceleration, the albedo and infrared radiation. And I will show you the plots in the time domain and also as color maps as a function of the sun height over the orbital plane and the difference between the argument of latitude of the satellite with respect to the sun. And we use Ceres data to model the Earth's albedo infrared radiation. And here we see the results in the time domain. Of course, the albedo and infrared radiation are too small to be, to be uh, read uh, from, this, uh, from these plots. And these are the radial transfer and out of plane direction, Gauss, Gauss frame. We model the attitude law of this spacecraft, which, which um, it, it's a quite complex law because you have to keep the, the antennas located to, to Earth. So in other pointing, why you must uh, all, uh, keep the, the, um, the solar panels towards the sun. And this is not possible during eclipses transitions rigorously because there is a, a very huge variation of, of this attitude nominal law in blue, which um, is, too, is too fast and direction winds are not able to follow it. And so the law is modified during eclipses by this smoother, uh, smoother behavior in, in red. And these are the synoptic view in the beta delta u plane. Here we have the results for E08, so it's a nominal satellite, not as an eccentric one. We have on, on the left this radial acceleration of the sun, and on the right we have the albedo and infrared acceleration. And so these plots are quite nice because you can study the symmetry uh, of the geometry of the satellite Earth sun position, relative position, but also the, the geometry dictated by the attitude of the, of the satellites. So we expect that when we are able, when, when we'll be able to use the finite element model to enrich, to have more, much more details in this kind of plots, this is the transfer accelerations and the out of plane. The precise orbit determination will be performed with Geodyne 2 and with the Bernese software, which is fully dedicated to navigation satellite. Now we are trying to, to improve the setup of our current models. And uh, we are evaluating the maximum degree and order of the gravity field to be used. And as said, uh, we will use uh, both microwave tracking and uh, laser tracking. And also we must fix the most favorable arc length depending uh, of the POD, depending on the kind of measurement we are going to, to perform. This is a very rough orbit determination, assuming a, a cannonball for this satellite. These are empirical acceleration that we have estimated to absorb what we have not modeled yet in, in the POD. We have a radial transfer and out of plane acceleration, constants, and once per revolutions. And these are the range residuals. And what is very important is that they have a mean close to zero. So this means that actually. Uh, uh, using the empirical, we have been able to remove any possible systematic deficiency in, in, in the model. But of course, we need to, to improve the model and not use at the end the empirical accelerations. We also started a pre-analysis of the clock data of the A14-18 satellite, so of the two satellites in eccentric orbits. These are the same data used by the GREAT project, so by Klaus, uh, by Hermann et al. and Del et al. And this analysis is very important to obtain in the end correct clock bias to compare them with GR uh, prediction and extract from a, a fit a parameter alpha. Uh, so the characteristics uh, of this formula have been uh, discussed this morning by Klaus. I think I can skip this. This is the work, 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 uh, I don't remember the, the exact acronym. Um, very very structure. Yes, structure of, of our um, of our activities. In blue are those of the National Institute for Astrophysics. In yellow, those of the Polytechnico, and in green, those uh, of the Space Agency, Space Agency in Matera, 
but there are several links between these work packages. So my conclusions, we have introduced our general objectives regarding this new uh, project, Kalina for Science, and discussed mainly in the activities um, that are ongoing in Roma. Uh, special care is devoted to the non-gravitational perturbation because they are responsible for systematic errors. Uh, next step is to apply the box wing model that we call a simplified box wing model to these two satellites in a centric orbit and start their orbit determination. We also aim to improve the box wing uh, model, but based on a deeper information from ESA, we know that they must up, up, they up to date the metadata. And so we hope to find more, more detailed information, but on, we are trying to get in also uh, other uh, information for the optical properties of the antenna and panel by ourselves. Um, and very shortly, we also start the experimental activity for the development of a new accelerometer. So I stop here and many thanks for your attention. I hope yeah, that you have time. Questions? Okay. So I have a question. I have a question. I don't. I usually I don't know where to raise my hand. Probably I don't have. Um, uh, how much you have to improve the accelerometer? Do you plan um, to? You need some improvement in the accelerometer? Yes. Um, yeah. Now, as you know, currently we have an accelerometer flying on board the Bepi Colombo mission to Mer mm -hmm. Mercury, which has. Um, sensitivity of about 10 to the minus 8 meter per square second per square root of hertz. So in order to be able to, as I say, to have a sensitivity down to 10 to the minus 10 meter per square second, uh, we need to improve uh, this, uh, this sensitivity down to 10 to the minus 9 and possibly to 10 to the minus 10 meter per square second over square root of hertz. But the main problem is related also, one, one big problem is related not only with the sensitivity, but also with the uh, bandwidth of the accelerometer, because we must be able to, to measure accurately down to the orbital period of these satellites, which is about two times 10 to the minus five hertz. So uh, very at very low frequencies. I see, I see, uh, I see. Much, yeah. much more than those usually uh, measured, for instance, by the honor accelerometer on board the GRACE and now GRACE follow on mission. Okay, okay, thank you, David. Thank you. Are there more questions? Not, then thank you again, David, and we come to the Thank Last you. Before the uh, break, this is by Umberto Giacomelli on uh, large ring laser gyroscopes. Oh, very interesting talk. Umberto? Okay. Yeah, 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 I'm here. Now, I'm share my screen. Uh, and, very good. Uh, yeah, perfect. Can you see? Yeah, good. Okay, so good evening, everybody. I'm Umberto Giacomelli. I'm going to talk about the Lange Ring Laser Gyroscopes and more specifically the geometry stabilization and control of them. After a brief introduction of the general topic of uh, large ring laser gyroscopes, I'm focusing on the gyroscope GP2 and uh, the idea and the problem of geometry control. And then I show you two possible uh, systems to uh, actuate uh, this uh, uh, shape of the shape, this control for a uh, ring laser. Now, let's start from the beginning the uh, Seniac frequency. This is the working principle on which all ring lasers are based on. And for simplicity, let's image, image a circular cavity in which two constant propagating beams are circulating. And uh, um, in a static condition, we have that both ring lasers see the same optical path. And uh, this, so uh, the wavelengths of the lasers are the same. 
But if we had if we had a rotation to the reference frame of the ring laser, the optical path um, become different, and so also the wavelength is different. If I uh, extract the laser and uh, recombine them, we uh, can see an interference pattern at a specific uh, um, frequency, the Senyak frequency. And this frequency is uh, linked to the uh, geometrical structure of the laser and also to the angular velocity vector of the reference ray. The very first ring lasers have been realized by George Senyak in 1913. And nowadays, there are several uh, different ring lasers in terms of size and the shape. The main two are square and triangular, used uh, in many different fields, but especially the commercial uh, ring lasers are used in navigation. To have an idea of the sensitivity of ring lasers and the area of interest of these, these uh, different sensitivity. Let's see this simple scale. We have uh, the hair rotation rate that is uh, about 7.3, 10 to the minus five radians per second. And then we have the area of interest of the navigation that uh, goes uh, from uh, 10 to the minus five to 10 to the minus seven. And then from 10 to the minus uh, uh, 7 up to 10 to the minus 14, a large area of interest of all the uh, geoscience uh, um, phenomena, like seismic phenomena, earth tides, and uh, all of the geodesy. And then uh, when we reach 10 to the minus 14 and lower level of uh, sensitivity, uh, we have uh, the general relativity area of interest, that is the hour target uh, area. Large ring lasers are um, different in the world. We have uh, here an example of some of them. We have on the bottom left uh, the G, the state of art of ring lasers installed in the um, observatory of Bessel in Germany. And the, uh, on the bottom there is the Romy, another German laser installed in the observatory near Munich. It is an array of four triangular ring lasers assembled as a tetraedric uh, structure. And then we have uh, our Italian ring lasers, the Gingerino, installed uh, in the laboratory of uh, uh, Gran Sasso in near L'Aquila of the uh, NFN. And then there is the GC2 installed in the laboratory of the uh, NFN in Pisa. And I will focus uh, on this particular ring laser for this presentation. So let's see it in detail. It is a square ring, uh, ring laser of 1.6 meter side. It is uh, uh, realized with an uh, heterolytic structure. Uh, that means that uh, it has uh, mounted on a concrete bedrock and on a granite uh, surface, but it is realized with a modular structure of steel pipes and corners that hold the mirror of the ring. Uh, it is tilted with respect to the floor of 37 degrees in order to maximize the effect of the high rotation rate on the ring. And under each corner, there is a, a piezo motor that can move the corner along the diagonal direction. And uh, the last peculiarity of this ring laser is that uh, in addition to the square cavity, it has also other two cavities that are the uh, diagonal. Now, why uh, the geometry is so important? That's because if you remember the uh, scale of sensitivity we, uh, to uh, detect uh, uh, general relativity phenomena we need uh, um, to detect we need to detect something of the order of 10 to the minus 13 radian per second that in relative units with respect to the high rotation rate we speak about something of the order of 10 to the minus 10. This means that all of the parts in this equation must be uh, stable and must uh, be no, uh, known at this uh, level. Especially here we speak about uh, the what we call the scale factor or geometry factor, the ratio between area and perimeter of the ring laser. To control and to monitor this uh, uh, factor, there are two main uh, ways. Uh, control the diagonal or the perimeter. 
Uh, in our, um, at the beginning of our study, uh, the perimeter shows some drawback uh, and some problems uh, acting on this. So we start to, uh, with the, the diagonal. We have realized that a mathematical model and, and, and the mathematical studies of all possible perturbation of uh, the square of, of the ring lasers. And in the hypothesis of small perturbation of the perfect square, we have, we have uh, obtained six fundamental deformation linked to the diagonal movement that uh, linearly combined can reconstruct any kind of uh, uh, deformation of the shape of the ring. And in particular, we have evaluated the uh, scale factor formula uh, in function of any kind of deformation. I will underline that the only deformation that affects the scale factor at the first order is uh, um, the uh, first one, that is the isotropic dilatation or contraction of the ring. The other deformation and are at the second order. So uh, considering these, if we are able to stabilize the system, uh, the, the first kind of deformation at the first order, all of the other bring, uh, become relatable and we can assume that uh, our scale factor is stable at the requested value. Um, these are a resume with this plot that shows the scale factor variation in relative units on vertical axis and on the right axis we have the displacement of the uh, mirror of the um, of the ring and on the uh, left axis we have the unbalancing in the difference of the length of the two diagonals this plot uh, helps us to determine the starting point of our system in terms of uh, again displacement of the mirror and uh, unbalancing of the diagonals uh, thanks to these two we can identify the region that we are uh, on which we are and the level of uh, um, stability of the scale factor. How we realize uh, the stabilization? Uh, theoretically, it is uh, quite simple. We start with a very uh, high stable laser in terms of frequency, and we want to transfer the frequency stability of the laser to mechanical stability of the diagonal. To realize this, we use a, a pound river hole feedback loop. We modulate the frequency of the laser with an electro-optic modulator. And using a acoustic modulator and piezoelectric actuator, we feedback the, um, uh, we send the, we feedback uh, the uh, laser light in, in order to stabilize uh, uh, the diagonal. The system is enough to fix the diagonal length, but not to control how much uh, our uh, controlling system is good and how uh, and if it is enough to reach the target stability. So, to control this, we have uh, the second loop using a second voltage controlled oscillator that can monitor the free spectral range of the diagonal. Um, in this uh, way, we can uh, uh, monitor the length of the diagonal during the period of the locking. The results of this test are summarized in these two plots. On the left, we have uh, the Allen deviation of the two diagonals uh, during a locking period. And on the right, we have the reconstructed angular rotation rate of the hairs during two periods when the diagonals are free running on the bottom and when the diagonals are locked on the top. Um, the plot on the left tells us that the uh, main noise that affects our, uh, in our system is Gaussian noise. So increasing the integration time, we can reach a higher level of stability. And uh, it is also important to remember that GP2 is installed in the local uh, section of uh, MFN in PISA that is inside the university campus. So this means that the environmental noise is really, really high. 
So we are confident that when we have realized our final um, system, the uh, starting point of the Allen division will be lower and also and the uh, level of uh, target stability will be rich in um, slow or in um, a short integration time than the one in uh, this plot. Nevertheless, uh, if we see uh, the two angular rotation rate reconstruction, the effects and the benefits of the locking are clear. We have no more uh, period of uh, uh, unmutable data. Uh, we call it, uh, in this case, the, the other are we, it's in split mode. It is impossible to reconstruct the um, Steinac frequency. And also, our algorithm of uh, data reconstruction works well. Indeed, uh, this large oscillation here we uh, are suppressed. But um, as I said, uh, the, uh, the diagonals are not the only system to control the um, shape of the ring. There is also the perimeter that at the beginning we do not consider as available system. But and but uh, uh, it is um, with increasing our knowledge in uh, ring lasers, we uh, found that it, is, it has also some potentialities. So we have uh, started to study also this uh, system uh, to realize uh, uh, the perimeter lock. It's uh, particularly simple with respect to the diagonals. Uh, extracting one of the two monobeams that circulate inside the laser. And uh, using an external reference, we make a bit note between these two. And acquiring with the photodiode, we use a phased locked loop to generate a correction signal for uh, the uh, four piezoelectric actuator to keep uh, the uh, frequency fixed. In this way, we keep the optical frequency of the laser fixed, and consequently, also the uh, perimeter will be fixed. Uh, this system uh, is not enough good uh, as the diagonals in terms of uh, transferring uh, of the stability from the perimeter to the entire scale factor. And also our equation in the theoretical model uh, show this, but uh, at, uh, also other potentialities, as we can see here. We can see the stability of uh, uh, the wavelength in the plot right. Uh, with the, the uh, classic under Allen deviation, and on uh, the left plot, uh, the right plot, we have uh, the angular rotation rate reconstruction. This uh, the potentiality of this system is that uh, it is uh, really simple to realize, and this means that we uh, we can reach easy um, long period of stability. Here we have eight days of continuously acquisition system that uh, we has been broken only by a um, blackout in the lab. So uh, theoretically, we can continue uh, for many, many days uh, with the same uh, system. There is also another system to fix the perimeter that no, needs no other system uh, than the ring lasers itself. Um, that's because increasing the power of the laser inside the ring, we can obtain two uh, or multiple, at least two um, longitudinal modes that circulate inside the laser. And with the photodiode and the same uh, phase locked loop, we can fix the uh, bit, the self bit node between two, cons, uh, two consequential uh, longitudinal mode that is exactly the free spectral range of the ring lasers. This system is particularly powerful because, as I said, we do not need anything about uh, in, in everything in addition to the ring lasers itself. Uh, it is a system that we are uh, studying nowadays, so we do not have results about this, but uh, it seems to be very, very um, uh, interesting and powerful for uh, other uh, applications. So let's uh, uh, summarize. 
uh, our mathematical model and experimental test has demonstrated that the um, diagonal system is the correct way to stabilize a laser for uh, a ring laser for uh, the general relativity particles. But increasing the knowledge in ring lasers, we have discovered that also the perimeter has some uh, potentiality, in particular, uh, thanks to the fact that uh, the self bit knot technique uh, do not need anything uh, more about the ring laser itself to uh, produce uh, a stabilization. And this will be useful, for example, for some uh, uh, observatory use uh, that are not uh, specific uh, for general relativity. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your talk. Are there questions? Questions? No questions. There will be another talk on Jinja on on laser on ring laser interferometry. Okay, then we perhaps can postpone these questions to the next talk. And if you then like to answer, then you are welcome. To uh, answer the corresponding question. So, thank you very much to all the speakers. Uh, we have now a break uh, by 20 minutes. And so we come back at, uh, or we start again at 10 past five, no, 10 past six, 10 past six, sorry, 10 past six. So, yeah. Okay. You can, you can make a coffee uh, and, uh, and have a short snack and ah. then. Come back with a okay. new hour. Okay. Okay. Good. Then, then see you in a minute. Faisal, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to talk to find that possible. Hello. Yes. Sorry, I had Hi. a problem, with, an issue with the microphone. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hi, okay. Klaus. Hi. Yeah, nice to hear you. Uh, not yet with the with with video, but yeah. Um, I have to say that I have an own talk, uh, which is scheduled at the quarter to seven. Uh, I, I, I just was at the other session. It is a bit delayed, so maybe five minutes or so, but probably I will not be able to be with you up to the end of your talk. So unfortunately, there was, uh, yeah, uh, with this big conference, there's always uh, some 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 problems with the talk. So they scheduled my talk for for a quarter to seven. So um, then I probably uh, leave a bit earlier than you finish, unfortunately. And then um, Angela will take over the discussion. Yeah, that's fine. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. So the first talk now is by um, Giorgio Carelli on the Ginger project. Perhaps you may share your Giorgio, George. George yes, yeah, sure. You are there. Ah, okay. Sorry. I yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay, you should okay. see it now. Yes, yes, perfect. Yeah, so thank you very much. And uh, yeah, please, please proceed with your talk. Okay. So I just want to talk a bit about the Ginger project and our first result. First result, you see something from the talk from Umberto, of course. Just the overview of the talk, just a few slides on the Sagnac effect something about the ring laser gyroscope that is the instrument that we 
choose in order to make our research, and then our project, the Ginger, an array of ring laser gyroscope for fundamental physics, because you know, ring laser gyroscope are used for application, and now we are thinking about why not fundamental physics, and then some results on our prototype. Of course, you know, the Sagnac effect is just the confrontational time required to complete a closed path in two opposite direction. And so you are looking to non-reciprocal effects. And this effect can be studied for light, as in our case, but of course you can use even different uh, probes, like cold atoms, like superfluids, or so on. In any case, you just make some special kind of interferometry. And up to now, the best results in sensitivity are obtained by a ring laser gyroscope in Germany, of course. And the best value obtained is a, <coughs> a sensitivity of the order of 10 to minus 12 radiant for, se for second of in one second. But what's important, as Umberto said you, is that we have to control this geometric parameter. And this was happened to application. We, you see there are a lot of applications that are working using uh, Sagnac effect. The most of them, of course, are inertial navigation, but there are some interesting results on uh, angle standards, you just have to use a small <laughs> rotating gyroscope in order to have a, an angle standard. They make some, we make a prototype, we made a prototype together with the people of the national institution here in Italy to make this kind of instrument. And then they are quite important in geoscience since you have a direct measurement of the angular component of the rotational components of earthquake. Usually people measure just with an array of linear accelerometer and reconstruct the rotational components. But with this instrument, you can directly measure the rotational component. And now let's think about fundamental science. Of course, in principle, you can use a gyroscope to measure the fundamental noise, the fluctuations of photon beams, you are inside an IFNS cavity, so you can, or you can measure some Lorentz violation or make some general relativity tests on the earth. That's quite important to be on the earth because it's much easier than to go on a satellite. And of course, you don't need a lot of models. You don't need a gravity map. You don't need a very good uh, knowledge of uh, the gravity potential, of course. But we, what you surely need is a stream of data, of long-term data. We are talking about, of course, of months, years of data. And you need an high sensitivity. Uh, the good question, of course, is which is this sensitivity? And Umberto said to you that in order to reach some gravitation uh, um, general relativity test, you need to go down to go to femtoradian per second over one second. Anyway, why is so important to use a ring laser gyroscope? Because they can work for months unattended. And when we talk about months, we really intend months. We have this a prototype working in Gran Sasso. And you know, there was last year there was a lockdown, so you can go there. We can go down in Gran Sasso, and it works all the time. Just there was a, a power <coughs> blackout, but apart from that, it worked all the time. And we learned something about uh, remote control of the system. We can switch on the system even from, uh, from Pisa. So we have all these features that we have. Uh, learned on our prototype, on our instruments. And so we are ready to make a, a large project. What we obtain on this prototype is that we really, we can have this uh, sensitivity, sub-picoradian sensitivity, 
of the order, of course. You can have a very large bandwidth, that's easy, since these instruments measure frequency. So we are very good at measuring frequency. You know, it's one of the best measuring quantity in physics. And then they have a very large dynamic range for the same reason, because you measure a frequency, you can measure things that goes near continuous, or you can measure the signals from the earthquakes. Our prototype is in a very active seismic zone in Italy. And so we can measure a lot of earthquakes, but we can also measure tidal signal, or we can measure the length of day. We can measure effect, of course, the effect of the moon. So we can work on a very large range, a dynamic range. What's important is that we have a gyroscope. We have a surface that <clears throat> the signal is proportional to the scalar product of the local vector of the gyroscope and the rotation vector. And so we can orient our system in different ways, or you can build different ring laser oriented in different way in order to reconstruct the angular rotation vector of the earth, of course. And our, our, the project so is based on an array of ring laser. They are underground, of course. The project is to build them underground sasso. So there is not anthropic uh, noise around. And the project aims to measure the land steering on the earth. On the earth. So we, we know that the land steering and the seat effect act on the angular attraction vector and they are summed to the earth rotation rate. We can measure the kinematic component. We can obtain the kinematic components by an independent measure, the measure by the international collaboration. And then there is another important feature of this kind of measure that we are in a fixed position. And so in order to synchronize our clock, we don't need to uh, average on the latitude, on the position. We don't need the map of the gravity. And in this way, we can think that we can even discriminate between different uh, gravitational theories. For instance, uh, there was a proposal from Jay Tasson. We give them some data in order to measure a Lorentz violation, the Lorentz violation, in order to measure the Lorentz violation. So we they need just a sensitivity of the order of one in 10 to the nine, and that's it. We have this sensitivity. And so they are making some calculation in order to see if it's possible to see this violation, for instance. These are the kind of effect that you see tra the earth, the real earth rotation rate, the kinematic one, the deceit effect, and the land steering. For instance, you can use the data, the, the results from Ginger in order to uh, build constraints for the extended theories of gravity. And so there is some evaluation of this effect and they are inside the possibility of our prototype. And these are the kind of sensitivity that are needed to, me to make this measurement, for instance. And so these are some proposal in order to use the data of Ginger. But as you know, it's not important only to have sensitivity when you are making measurement of fundamental physics, you have even a problem of accuracy. And that is the problem that you are trying to solve because as you see from the, for instance, the data on geometry that Umberto showed before, you have a very good sensitivity, but really in that measurement, we don't really know the exact length of the perimeter of our object. Not not yet. We need some more work. Anyway, this ginger, this project, 
will in any case provide very useful data for geodesy for because we can measurement with very good results the length of the day and we can obtain interesting data in seismology of course because we are very close to the inactive area and so we can measure not only the conventional quantity of uh, the earthquake but we are in, really in the near field so we can make very interesting rotation measurement of earthquake in near field of course one single instrument is not a good idea in physics if you have a lot of them is much better and is here you can see where are these objects in the world up to now and as you see there is these nice things that you have here in germany and about the same on the same line you have here in italy and then you have in the opposite side of the earth the one in new zealand and this is quite a nice feature and then you have this one in one that is far from both of them and can be used for the same in particular the the one that are operative up to now is this one this two one in germany of course and this one in the last one in one is a passive one anyway it can be interesting the same of course this is a uh, a small group of people and so we are in some way we are working together together we are collaborating for instance you can find people from that cell that quite often goes in canterbury and then the main difference between uh, ginger and the best uh, ring laser working up to now is that the the ring laser in that cell is a monolithic object so the uh, ring laser is just on the top of a zero dual plate so you can have just that one you have no more in our case we have an electrolytic structure so we have a mechanic model that can be reproduced many times in different uh, planes in this way we can align this different structure on at different angles and we can measure using an array of uh, gyroscope all the vectorial quantity of the system of course in our case since we are not on uh, a slab of zero door, we need to have a, a very thermally stable environment that's why we went uh, underground we went in Gran Sasso and we need a place where the anthropic activity is very low that's why we have very good data during the lockdown period of course even in that structure and even there we are in a cavity underground so the uh, daily variation temperature is the, the order of one hundredth of degree and the annual variation is of the order of a tenth of a degree we have a signal from the correlated to the temperature to the temperature variation but on of course you measure the temperature and you can correlate these results and these are just a short story of the previous prototypes you see this one was the first one and it had an interesting application we just put it on the, the same building of the Virgo central area the area where they, they use for the detector of gravitational waves and we have a strong we measure a strong correlation between the data of the gyroscope and the, the strong wind in on the building of the prototype and this one is a uh, the place of the prototype in Gran Sasso you see you are inside the tunnel it's a 3.6 meter as a square in this direction yeah of course this one is just the the prototype the the plane then you put a room on the top of the, of the object and these are the prototype described by Umberto of course that we have here in Pisa because the prototype in Gran Sasso is free running stay there works for months years but you have to improve the system the grand sasso is free running this one in pizza can be locked up to now for instance 
And this was the, the small prototype work that worked as a goniometer. That's that's our, this one are the results of uh, <clears throat> Umberto. And what is important that why we use all these uh, small prototype in Pisa, it's because we can make a lot of tests because we are just downstairs. And here, which is the main problem of an active ring laser, that you have a laser. So there are a, the effect of the nonlinear dynamic of the laser. So we have to develop some uh, analysis technique that take in account this dynamic and reconstruct the real, let's say, Sagnac frequency just on top of all the variation due to the dynamic of the laser. And these are the results that were obtained with this analysis. The last result was published uh, last year. And these results were obtained by 100 days of measurement taken from the uh, prototype in Gran Sasso. You see here is the ring laser. You can see here on the bottom of the picture is the discharge area. What is in interesting with this prototype and that of course, you have not only noise, you are really signal from the environment, signal from the, der derived from the effect of temperature on the system, tilting of the system, earthquake and so on. So you can make some kind of multi-messenger measurement as it's very unfashioned to say now, area on the top of the system, there are uh, a couple of tilt meter. You can hear there is also a um, seismic detector. We have a pressure detector. So you have a lot of environmental analysis. And so this means that you don't have just noise, but you have really signals on top of the Sagnac coming from the earth rotation. And you can use this signal, this real signal, for instance, the signal of the tides, the polar motion, the Chandra Wobber, in order to analyze the answers, the, uh, the, the responsivity of your instruments and to measure and to uh, make a real calibration of the object. This means that we used a linear regression methods in order to minimize our noise, in order to investigate which, which are the, uh, eventually if there are, the flows of our system, we know that we discovered that we have problem in the positioning of the prototype, for instance, because we can compare our Sagnac signal, for instance, with the signal from the IERS in order to measure the kinematic components. We can measure the tidal effect and we can use the signal from the tilt meter in order to reconstruct the effect of different things on our system. And this one, for instance, is the measurement of the frequency of the signal system, the Sagnac interferometer together, so imposed with the effect of the IRS measurements. And as you see here, this the last one, this one in uh, it's blue. Yes, it's blue. If you look at the green data, the last one, here we have our data and the IRS data. This one, the green one, just subtracting even the zonal tides. So in this way, we just compare our data with the kinematic results. And so we can just see that even uh, Gingerino, that is a small prototype and is just one component, 
you can have a good results, a good comparison with other, with the real rotation rate of the Earth. Here is the effect just of I talked about in short. You see, as you see, we have this this very nice resolution, and these are the typical results of our residuals. You see, this one was on the measurement of 100 days. And it's a free running instrument. We have some we have very good precision. The final result is something that is of the order of femtoradiant for second. So it's a very good sensitivity, a good, a very good precision. Of course, it's precision, not accuracy. So we have to work a bit in order to understand how the what we think is the main source of noise in our system, the shot noise. Uh, just a moment. I have a line here. You see, here is the expected shot noise, the, the level that you need to see to reach the sensitivity you, you need to reach in order to see the Lorentz violation. And this one is the sensitivity in order to see the line steering effect. So we have enough sensitivity about to see the Lorentz violation and then to work a bit in order to reach the sensitivity to see the lens steering effect. And then the, the main things that can affect our measurement, of course, is the laser. So we are still studying the effect of this laser. We have to work with a bit on the laser. And this is how we want to make our project. You see here is a two-dimensional array. Here we have one ring laser that is at the maximum of the signal. So you can measure in some way the amplitude of the vector. Here, there is one on the horizontal plane and you can put inside your system another one in the vertical direction. This one, of course, the one of the maximum of the signal need a very good alignment in comparison to the to the earth rotation but of course since you are looking for a maximum of signal you can reach it and this is the people that is involved in our in our lab in Gran Sasso you see these people from the ENF section of Pisa Napoli Legnaro and then there is a group from ENGV the National Institution of Geophysics and with some work with uh, our German colleagues, of course. And so our uh, future plan is that with this uh, prototype, we reach a resolution that is enough to measure the Lorentz violation. And so since the prototype is larger, we are on the good road in order to reach the sensitivity need for the lens steering effect, but we have to work on the accuracy. Up to now, we are just working on precision, OK? And this is how we want to work on this problem. We are trying to use the ring laser itself at the maximum signal in order to uh, have a good measurement, a good orientation of the system. So we want to use the ring laser itself, one of them, one of the array, in order to have a, the correct orientation in comparison to the Earth rotation axis. And that's all, and thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for a nice talk. Are there questions? Okay, no questions. At the Maxim Sangnac, uh, yeah, I had one question. I had one question, it had to do with the Maxim Sagnac uh, value or something that you said at the very end of the last slide. Sagnac effect. Yes, yes. So no, in other just... words, the precursor for Ginger to be working would be that you would have the Maxim Sagnac effect kicking in, is that correct? No, if we have just we just look at the Sagnac effect. You see, you you have just to to look at the at the at the signal from the bit between the two signal, 
and you have to maximize that signal. It's Thank just you, that sir. we need a, a, an experimental procedure in order to maximize that signal. Uh, so that's all that you're really referring, maximize the signal. So the, that's the reason why you refer to the SAGNAC effect, so you could get a maximization of the signal. I'm stupid of me. I just want to understand that. That's very basic, for at least my standards. No problem. Thank you, you for your patience. You just need to change the orientation. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we go on with the next talk by Fasai Hamad on uh, gravity gradient effects in quantum mechanics. Perfect. Okay. Can you see yeah, my screen? Wonderful. Yes, wonderful. Great. Thank you very much, Klaus. Uh, many thanks to the organizers. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my talk is about how gravitational tidal forces manage to bring Newton's equivalence principle to life in quantum mechanics. This uh, talk is based on a work done with my graduate students. So here's the outline of my talk. Uh, first, I will just uh, recall briefly the equivalence principle as it arises in, in classical mechanics and discuss where that does that stand within quantum mechanics. In this section two, I will describe two famous experiments done with cold neutrons because they are very relevant to the present talk. In section three, I will describe three ways of exploiting gravitational tidal forces in uh, quantum systems. And this will bring us to a remarkable mass independence which emerges whenever mg is equal to mi. In section five, I will discuss what does general relativity say about all this. And in section six, I will uh, describe a couple of experimental challenges. I will end this talk with a very brief conclusion. So let me start with uh, the equivalence principle as it rises in classical mechanics. Uh, the equivalence principle in classical mechanics might be traced back to John uh, Philoponus, also known as John of Alexandria around the fifth and the sixth century, who first observed that two balls of different masses fall at the same rate in contradiction to the teachings of Aristotle. Uh, only much later did Simon Stephen and Galileo Galilei redo the same experiments. First, Simon Stephen around 1586, using the Delft Church Tower in the Netherlands. That's the church tower. And I guess uh, he was standing somewhere here in this balcony. He dropped the, the, the heavy uh, weight balls. And Galileo Galilei redid, re, they redid the experiments around 1610, but using inclined planes instead. However, the modern distinction between gravitational mass and inertial mass goes back to Isaac Newton, who around 1680 uh, used pendulums to test the equivalence between these two concepts of mass. And this is what we uh, mean in this talk by the, the, the equivalence principle. It is the equivalence between the gravitational mass and the inertial mass. In the literature, this is known as Newton's equivalence principle. Uh, in contrast to other uh, more sophisticated definitions of the equivalence principle. Now, it is very instructive to look closer at how, at, uh, um, how these concepts of mass emerge in classical mechanics. For freely falling objects, we just use Newton's second law and the law of universal gravity. And that leads us to conclude that the acceleration of object falling should be proportional to the gravitational acceleration at the surface of the Earth. What is remarkable, however, is that the proportionality factor is just the ratio of mg to mi. And this is the main theme of this talk. That's for free fall. For pendulums, we do the same exercise, but using the moment acting on this pendulum for small angular displacement. The equation of motion, again, turns out to display the pure ratio of mg to mi. And it is thanks to this pure ratio that objects fall at the same rate, classical objects fall at the same rate, and pendulums all display the same period. Now, uh, to give you some numbers, classical experiments confirm the universality of free fall up to 10 to the minus 14 precision level. That's the, the, the work reported by Tubul and collaborators in 2017. At the quantum level, quantum experiments confirm the universality of free fall at the order of 10 to the minus seven, uh, uh, in this work by Albers and collaborators, 10 to the minus nine by Rosie and collaborators, and 10 to the minus 12 
by uh, some Bohm and collaborators. Now, the uh, important thing to keep in mind is that these quantum experiments rely on quantum interferometry. We'll come back soon to that. Now, uh, an interesting question is, uh, is can quantum mechanics uh, uh, give rise to this pure ratio, just as in classical mechanics. It would be very nice if it was the case, because we would be able to, to test whether this uh, gravitational mass is the same as the inertial mass for all objects. Unfortunately, quantum mechanics does usually not display an isolated ratio of mg to mi. Uh, why is that? It is because the Schrodinger equation with the gravitational potential has this form. The inertial mass is in the denominator of one term, and the gravitational mass is in the numerator of another term of the sum. Now, as an illustration of this issue, here is a reminder. Uh, uh, let's uh, recall the two famous experiments uh, trying to test the equivalence principle. Uh, the first one is the famous Cow experiment uh, done around 1975. It, is, uh, it consists of splitting the wave function of cold neutrons uh, whose wavelength is lambda into two branches. One branch climbs the gravitational potential to height z and then travels horizontally along a distance uh, l. Oops, sorry guys, I forgot my video all the time. Uh, and the other branch is traveling lower. Because of this difference in height, the two branches experience two different phases. Uh, and they, this gives rise to quantum interference. It turns out that the phase difference collected is proportional to the product of mg times mi, in contrast to classical mechanics, which involves the pure ratio of mg to mi. That's the first experiment. The second experiment is the Q-bounce experiment. It consists of making cold neutrons bounce off of a reflective plate horizontally. And because the uh, particle interferes with its own wave function, it occupies, it occupies only this, uh, the discrete states. And because of that, the energy is also quantized. And in contrast to classical mechanics, the energy does not involve the pure ratio again. It involves mg squared divided by mi. We'll come back to this in a moment. Now, from these two results, famous experiments, it seems then that because of the form of the Schrodinger equation, the dynamics of a quantum particle can really not involve the ratio of mg to mi in an isolated form. However, it turns out that the, 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 the experiments I just described contain two limitations. In fact, the first is that both results were limited to the linear approximation of the gravitational potential. That's the Newtonian gravitational potential. And we may expand this gravitational potential up to the first order in the height z measured from the surface of the Earth upwards. And Re is the radius of the Earth. So the experiments were limited to the linear uh, order of the gravitational potential. The second limitation is that both experiments did not fully exploit the spatial extension of the wave function. In fact, we know that any quantum system is spatially extended along the three dimensions of space. Here, I just represented the z coordinate and the x coordinate. The y coordinate is coming out of the screen. Now, thanks to the spatial extension of quantum systems, it turns out that there are actually at least three ways of exploiting the gravitational tidal forces on quantum systems. The first is to write down the gravitational potential in the Schrodinger equation in the non-inertial uh, frame sitting on the ground. The gravitational potential takes this form up to the second order, and z is hiding inside this parameter, zeta. Now, we recognize from this uh, gravitational potential uh, simple harmonic oscillators along the x and y axis, and they are easily solved, and they give rise to quantized energy along the uh, x and y axis. But the remarkable thing is that just as in classical mechanics, we recover the pure ratio of mg to mi. On, along the z-axis, we don't have a, harm, a simple harmonic oscillator. We have an inverted harmonic oscillator. And the, uh, solving the Schrodinger equation, we end up with this complicated wave function. But the remarkable thing is that this is d, the parabolic cylinder, cylinder function, and this is the gamma function. The remarkable thing is that we recover inside this wave function the pure ratio, as in classical mechanics. Unfortunately, because of this argument of the cylinder function, 
which involves the, the, the product of mg times mi, as in the cow experiment, everything is spoiled, uh, spoiled down. In fact, for z very small, the energy recovered is just that of the uh, Q-bounce experiment. But now we understand the origin of the absence of the pure ratio. It is because of this product in the wave function. That's the first way of exploiting gravitational tidal forces. The second way is to consider not fixed boundaries, but moving boundaries. So the two boundaries, the reflective plates, are moving upwards to meet the particle as it falls down. Z0 and Z1 are the initial positions of the boundaries. Solving the Schrodinger equation with such boundaries, we end up remarkably with an energy that decays in time, but the decay rate depends on the pure ratio again, just as in classical mechanics, mg divided by mi. The third way of exploiting tidal forces is to put the system inside a freely falling laboratory. For that, we need something like this, a drop tower. Of course, we're not going to drop people. We need uh, to drop a quantum system. For that, we need something like this, the Zarm drop tower in Bremen, Germany. It is about 140 meters high, but actually we need more than this, as we will see now. For this, we need to uh, write down the gravitational potential in the Schrodinger equation in the inertial frame. It takes this form, and here we don't distinguish between gravitational and inertial mass because the equations get very complicated. But as we will see now, this does not remove much of the physics. In fact, tau is the proper time inside the, the freely, freely falling laboratory, and we recognize here a time-dependent simple harmonic oscillators. Uh, the function r of tau has this form. r naught is the initial radial coordinate of the system away from the center of the Earth. To solve the equation, it is convenient to, to, to introduce uh, these parameters, t naught and the reduced time, t. Solving that, we easily find the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. It is quantized, and it depends on time uh, with this complicated function. But what is important is the absence of mass. And therefore, this expectation value is mass independent. And this signals the presence of the pure ratio of mg to mi. And that's for the, uh, the Hamiltonian. For the width, we can consider the width of the wave packet. It turns out if that, that if we compute the rate of change of the width, the relative rate of change of the width of the wave packet, as it falls down towards the surface of the Earth, it is mass independent as well. And this brings us now to the following remarkable mass independence whenever mg is the same as mi. In the non-inertial reference frame, we just saw that the energy depends on the pure ratio. So yes, whenever mg is the same as mi, we would found, find a mass independent behavior. But in the non-inertial frame along the z direction, the presence of this product spoils everything. Uh, for the non-inertial frame with moving boundaries, yes, we would have a decay rate, which is mass independent. In the, non, in the inertial frame along the x and y axis, both the expectation value of the Hamiltonian and the rate of change of, of, the, of the width of the wave packet are mass independent. This brings us to the following very nice conclusion, that the mass independence that we recover here is due to the combined spatial extension of the wave function and the gravitational tidal forces. In other words, this is possible by combining at, at an equal footing inertia and gravity thanks to gravitational tidal forces. And now uh, let me just briefly discuss what does general relativity have to say about this. First, recall that the Schrodinger equation with the gravitational potential uh, is extracted from the Klein-Gordon equation in curved spacetime. This is the Klein-Gordon equation. This is, these are the Christoffel symbols. G mu nu is the inverse, uh, component, uh, the inverse components of the metric. Mi is the inertial mass of the, of the system. In order to go from here, to the Schrodinger equation, we need to, to extract the rapidly oscillating phase. And that is guaranteed by special relativity, but it depends on the inertial mass. Now, uh, plug in these two inside a spherically symmetric static metric, we arrive at this equation. The important thing to notice about this equation is that there is only the inertial mass. And this uh, brings us to the following very interesting conclusion. Universality of gravity, as implemented in general relativity, seems to be due to the universality of quantum mechanics. The wave function is shaped by inertia, and gravity acts on the wave function, so gravity have to, to, to depend only on inertia. 
And finally, let me just briefly discuss a couple of experimental challenges that are obviously going to be uh, there. The major hindrance would be to maintain quantum coherence as usual for quantum systems. For a freely falling laboratory, times larger than 38 seconds are required. For moving boundaries, at least two hours of quantum coherence uh, is required. Uh, uh, on the other hand, just a side note, we can use, instead of a single quantum particle, like a neutron, we could use a Bose-Einstein condensate. Unfortunately for that, to work, we need to use to, 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 to apply the gross pitaevsky equation, which is highly nonlinear. And finally, let me now conclude this talk with a couple of remarks. Just as in classical mechanics, it is possible to devise setups for which a quantum phenomenon depends on the ratio of mg to mi in an isolated form. Mass independent behavior could be witnessed in quantum systems inside a gravitational field whenever the inertial mass is identical to the gravitational mass. And finally, these results provide uh, then a, a novel way for testing the equivalence principle be between the two concepts of mass. In other words, to go back to the roots of the equivalence principle, which is the identity between the two masses. Uh, many thanks for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Faisal. A very nice, uh, very nice presentation. Thank you. Questions? I have one very short question, and uh, if it's not worth answering, I looked at your presentation at about uh, the different type of Schrodinger equations involved. Are you still able to use something like Ernst's theorem to make an equivalence between classical and quantum results? To say, especially when you talk about Schrodinger equations and the non-inertial frame, can you still use something like Ernst's theorem as a good approximation, or does that break down? Absolutely. That's a very, very important point. Uh, we didn't explore this idea, very nice idea in our work, but it, it could be exploited in the sense that if we, if we apply Ernfors theorem, we should be able to recover the mass independence uh, that we know and love. We should be mechanics. able to recover it or something like that. But what it means also too, though, is the concept of inertia might be some sort of an approximation that gets the, the, uh, of inertial mass and the other things is an approximation that my example get washed out of this Ernfest term or its equivalence unless that we set up uh, initial conditions in a very special way. Absolutely. I, I, I totally agree with that. A very good point because these this work shows, uh, avoids that, um, that um, approximation that inertia is an emergent phenomena from Ernfors theorem. We go to the heart, we avoid Ernfors theorem and go to the heart of a single particle uh, treated quantum mechanically. Does that answer your question? Pretty much, uh, pretty much it does answer it. But what I just am saying is that you might be able to, it also too ties in with what called the embedding in the, uh, with, you know, like the uh, general relativistic about why you're able to fall out and uh, recover the Schrodinger equation. I'm very familiar with that approximation that you picked. And I think to a certain degree, that's also tied in to say too about the limits of applicability of something like Ernfest serum. That also has a role in it too. Okay, I get your point. Thanks, yes. Mm. More questions? Uh, I have a curiosity. Uh, but yes. This is of course, all this framework is, is very, very nice and I hope would be a reality. But there are already experiments investigating uh, uh, quantum mechanical system in this respect? Uh, as far as we know, no. All the experiments done so far are based on quantum interferometry. I and see. in that case, they always, always at the end, the final result involves one way or another the mass. In our case, mm -hmm. we try to only get, a, get the pure ratio of mg to mi. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I hope it will be a sooner reality. Thank you. Yeah, Thank hopefully. You, Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Okay. Uh, more questions, or we can move to the other speaker. I am lost here. Okay, I think it's the turn of Matthew Robbins using Bose Einstein condensate as gravitational wave detectors. Please. Let me start uh, yeah. the presentation. There we go. 
Oh, uh, thank you for the introduction. As was just mentioned, today I'm going to be talking to you about how we might be able to use Bose-Einstein condensates to detect gravitational waves. This was done in collaboration with Niashef Shorty, Alan Jameson, and Robert Mann at the University of Waterloo. So to start, let's look at what the current state of detectors are. We see that there's been a lot of effort to saturate the gravitational wave spectrum to detect gravitational waves from the nanohertz regime all the way up to the hundreds of hertz and just verging into the kilohertz regime. And what I've shown on this plot is in black, they are the gravitational wave detectors that are currently in operation, whereas in blue are the ones that are under construction or have been proposed. And what you notice is that there's a few commonalities between these detectors. If you want to detect nanohertz gravitational waves, then you need to use some sort of pulsar timing array technique. If you're interested in the millihertz regime, then you might need to do something like LISA build an interferometer in space. Or if you're interested in something in the hundreds of hertz, then a terrestrial interferometer like LIGO or Virgo should suffice. But this raises the question of what's beyond the hundreds of hertz regime? What happens if you go into this regime where you're looking at things in the kilohertz uh, frequency spectrum? Well, there's a variety of sources that we could see. A few of them are listed on the screen here. We could see similar things as what LIGO can currently see, though with lower mass black hole and neutron star in spirals. We could also see newborn magnetars and potentially, if they exist, axion clouds around black holes. Now, this raises the question of, well, how are we going to detect such sources in the kilohertz regime? And to do this, we might need to use a different technique. And it was proposed back in 2014 by Yvette Fuentes and her group that, well, maybe we could use a Bose-Einstein condensate to detect these kilohertz sources. Now, if we have a Bose-Einstein condensate that detects gravitational waves, that means that the gravitational wave itself will need to imprint some signature on the Bose-Einstein condensate. And, well, the gravitational wave app amplitude is classical, the Bose-Einstein condensate is quantum, meaning that we somehow need to use uh, some technique to detect a classical observable, a classical quantity with the quantum system, because this classical quantity cannot be represented as an operator observable. Well, one way to do this is by calculating the fidelity between uh, two states with the observable imprinted on them and comparing it to the initial state. So what we have here is some uh, initial state rho naught and it evolves in two different ways. It can evolve to some state rho sub epsilon versus some state rho sub epsilon plus d epsilon where what we want to detect is this quantity epsilon. We want to be able to measure it. Well, what we can do is calculate the fidelity between these two states, and that would allow us to define something known as the quantum Fisher information, which is basically the amount of information stored in a single measurement of epsilon. Now, the reason why the quantum Fisher information is important is because we can use it to basically bound our sensitivity of a measurement of epsilon. Basically, as we increase the amount of quantum Fisher information of a single measurement, then we are able to improve the sensitivity to a measurement of epsilon. So a gravitational wave detector using a, a Bose-Einstein condensate as a gravitational wave detector uh, has basically been uh, taken to be some hard wall potential for simplicity. And before a gravitational wave passes by, there's going to be some sort of phonons within the Bose-Einstein condensate. And well, when a gravitational wave passes by, it was shown by Yvette Fuentes and her group that new phonons will be created, meaning that there will be new phonon statistics uh, in the condensate. So if you compare the state of the phonons before the 
gravitational wave passed by and the state of the phonons after the gravitational wave passed by, then, well, maybe you can do some sort of phonon detection uh, methodology, uh, differentiate between the two states, and therefore you might be able to say something about the gravitational wave that passed by your condensate. So what I want to look at now is take this idea and consider it in the context of a transient gravitational wave. I won't go through the math, but simply give you the highlights of uh, the results that we have obtained. What we have is a phonon, the equation of motion of the phonons that looks like this, where it's going to depend on a couple of quantities. Our equation of motion depends upon our frequency of the gravitational wave, as well as the duration of a single measurement of the Bose-Einstein condensate. So after doing some math using the quantum Fisher information, one is able to get the sensitivity that looks something like this, where we have omega being the frequency of the phonons. R is some function that I don't really want to get into, but for the purposes of this presentation, it's basically uh, describing the squeezing of your initial phonons. And as you squeeze the phonons more, you're going to increase R, meaning that you get better sensitivity. You also see that the sensitivity is going to depend upon the number of observations of your gravitational wave, and it will depend upon this uh, collection of exponentials. So, the natural thing to ask is, are we able to do something with this function such that we maxim we optimize the sensitivity to gravitational waves? And the answer is yes, we can, by noting that if omega gw over two is equal to our phonon frequency, what we get is a location of resonance. This is going to be where we are able to maximize the sensitivity to gravitational waves. So let's do this and see what we get if we use uh, our phonons on resonance with the gravitational waves. Depending on our speed of sound of our phonons, we're able to get a slightly different uh, frequency regimes that we can detect gravitational waves in. And we can also change the sensitivity to gravitational waves where what I've done is assume that we can make the best possible condensate we've ever been able to make using current experimental capabilities. I'm taking the condensate to be some cube of length 10 to the minus four meters and phonon squeezing to be about 7.2 decibels. And what we see is that even in the best case scenario, we have a sensitivity of about 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 11, with the Bose-Einstein condensate for uh, transient gravitational waves, whereas advanced LIGO is uh, nah, about 12 orders of magnitude more sensitive. So, well, this is kind of disappointing. It doesn't look like we're able to detect transient gravitational waves using current experimental techniques. So let's see how we can make this more sensitive. I mentioned that if you squeeze phonons, you're going to get a uh, greater sensitivity to gravitational waves. So let's just squeeze the phonons and see how much we need to squeeze to achieve advanced LIGO sensitivity. And what you see is we're currently at around this level of sensitivity. And if you wanted to squeeze your phonons to advanced LIGO sensitivity, you would need to squeeze by 130 decibels, which I'll be the first to admit is completely outrageous. And this is assuming that absolutely nothing else would go wrong with any other part of your experiment. This is in the most ideal situation that you can imagine. And well, 130 decibels would be it's what the model shows, but it's a little unrealistic. So let's ask another question. Let's say that we start incorporating more physical features into the model. For instance, damping. 
damping is going to be present within a Bose-Einstein condensate, regardless of what temperature it's at. So if we incorporate damping, what we see is that the moment we do, and if we still push our model to its limit, such that we squeeze as much as we possibly can without uh, going beyond the validity of the model, we see that, well, unfortunately, we're still going to be a few orders of magnitude away from advanced LIGO's design sensitivity. So the upshot is that, well, maybe a Bose-Einstein condensate isn't going to be too promising for detecting a transit gravitational wave. But not all is lost. There's more types of gravitational waves out there. So let's go to a continuous gravitational wave. This is the sort of gravitational wave that was first considered by Yvette Fuentes and her group. Now, what we're going to do is consider a continuous gravitational wave, but instead of just having a cubic condensate with the constant speed of sound, we're going to be considering a cubic condensate with an oscillating speed of sound. So what we get is a phonon equation of motion that's going to depend upon what your average speed of sound is. It will depend upon your phonon wave number. And it's going to depend upon basically your amplitude of oscillations of your speed of sound. It will depend upon the perturbation of the speed of sound around its average value. And what we see is that this is basically the Mathieu differential equation. The reason why I indicate that this is the Mathieu differential equation is because there's some nice properties of it that we're able to exploit. And this is because we get instability bands. We, we see that depending on the value of A, this is the oscillation amplitude of our speed of sound, compared to the ratio between our phonon frequency and our gravitational wave frequency, we're going to get these bands of instability, where if a phonon lies within these instability bands, eventually uh, the theory is going to break down, the condensate is going to be unstable, which is normally a bad thing, but hey, when life hands you lemons, you make lemonade. So, Let's try and exploit these instability bands. It turns out that if a phonon lies within these bands of instability, it's actually able to amplify the sensitivity to gravitational waves. Now, because these are instability bands, we can't just lie within them for some arbitrary period of time. We're only able to measure the phonons within these regions up to their instability time. So basically what we did is we calculated what their maximum uh, instability time is, how we calculated the maximum instability time and basically said, if we only measure phonons for that period of time, what sort of sensitivity are we going to get? And the sensitivity for a gravitational wave detector using a Bose-Einstein condensate it's going to look like this, where for simplicity, we're going to assume that we have some sort of 100 micron cubic condensate with a speed of sound on average of one centimeter per second, staring at a gravitational wave of 1000 Hertz. We will take the Bose-Einstein condensate lifetime to be three seconds, and the total observation time will be one year. The way that we get around this three second to one year uh, difference is by saying that we have some sort of Bose-Einstein condensate. Lifetime is three seconds. After three seconds, we regenerate it. We get another condensate with exactly the same parameters, measure for another three seconds and keep doing that over the course of a year. And if we do that, what we see is the maximum sensitivity turns out to be 10 to the minus 12. Now, this is for within one of the bands of instability. What we see is that if the phonon frequency to gravitational wave frequency is exactly a half, this corresponds to the shortest 
instability time. What this means is that we're not going to have a sensitive, we're not going to get sensitivity to gravitational waves because there isn't enough time for the Bose-Einstein condensate to measure the gravitational waves. Basically, the instability time isn't long enough. But as we move within our resident, residence, as we move towards the edge of residence, the instability time increases, and this allows us to gain greater sensitivity to gravitational waves. At this peak, this is where the instability time is equal to the lifetime of the Bose-Einstein condensate. So this is where we optimize the sensitivity. If we try to uh, go further out in our residence, this is where the maximum instability time is going to be greater than the lifetime of our Bose-Einstein condensate, and meaning that we're going to be limited by our Bose-Einstein condensate lifetime, there's not going to be enough time to gain enough sensitivity to detect gravitational waves. Now, 10 to the minus 12 isn't that great of sensitivity, so let's see what we can do to improve it. And the way that we can improve it is by increasing the size of our condensate, increasing the average speed of sound. And what we see is that now we're looking at sensitivities of 10 to the minus 20, which is much closer to what LIGO can do, meaning that this is still going to be difficult to, uh, it's still going to be difficult to detect gravitational waves using a Bose-Einstein condensate, but it's not immediately unfeasible. It will take a lot of work, but potentially it could be done in the near future. And in this plot, I also incorporated damping, and we see that damping is going to have some sort of effect, but it's not going to be a game changer. It's not going to completely destroy your sensitivity, even if you're considering a gravitational wave of 50,000 hertz. Now, to gain greater sensitivity, one can uh, naively increase the length of the condensate, increase the speed of sound, though this is going to uh, raise questions, mainly the fact that we don't know how to increase lengths to millimeter sizes or go to like 10 centimeter per second, 100 centimeter per second speeds of sound. If we could, then that would be able to increase our sensitivity to gravitational waves even more. Now, what I want to say is that there are still going to be a number of experimental challenges. I've talked about damping. It's going to limit your sensitivity at higher frequencies. You also need to worry about three-body recombination, which basically decreases the number of atoms in your trap, meaning that you're going to decrease the lifetime of the Bose-Einstein condensate, meaning that your uh, maximum that is going to decrease the maximum instability time, meaning that at the end of the day, you're going to destroy your sensitivity. And you also need to worry about laser noise in your trap, which also is going to decrease sensitivity to gravitational waves. So the ultimate question is, is the gravitational wave detector possible if you use a Bose-Einstein condensate? And for transient gravitational waves, it's looking unfeasible. But for continuous gravitational waves, it may actually work a lot better. It will be difficult, but it's not immediately impossible. Though, as I mentioned, Bose-Einstein condensate will, as a gravitational wave detector, will work for larger lengths. And there are several experimental challenges, especially the lifetime of the trap. If you increase the lifetime of your condensate, you're going to be able to get greater sensitivity out. So the one thing I want to end up end off with is that a Bose-Einstein condensate potentially provides a new and exciting opportunity in gravitational wave astronomy, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments that you might have. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Questions? I have, a, I have one short question. Uh, go to slide 14. Slide 14, please. There we go. 
All right, lay the noise of the trap. Decrease the sensitivity to gravitational waves. Is that in any way similar to uh, Johnson noise? Similar or is it completely different? Oh, it's been a while since I thought about Johnson noise. Could you quickly remind me what it is? Oh, uh, she don't know what it is. Uh, I don't want to take the time. You can yeah. look it up later. I, I, I don't want to waste people's yeah. time with that. Okay, I would just mm -hmm. uh, add that this is... Uh, related to the shot noise of the trap. That's what I was thinking. Look. That's what I was thinking, yes. Yeah. You hit it. Yeah. Matthew, but you are looking at some specific source of gravitational waves? Not really. We're saying that let's assume that there is some source that we can detect in the kilohertz regime. If it exists, could we put in principle, be able to detect it. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, yeah, but, of... uh, but, uh, but uh, the, the, this property of uh, condensate, it, it is used with some other for some other application already? Yeah. Um, it... <clears throat> oh, oh, well, I guess condensates mm -hmm. have been used in uh, cold atom interferometry, not I in see. the context of phonons, okay. but like for the MAGIS experiment where you're able to detect they're hoping to detect gravitational waves in the like 0.1 to yeah. one or 10 hertz region. I see, I see, I see. I see. Mm. Okay, uh, if, well, I don't see the, uh, the hands raising because um, if no one, no, no other question, we move to the last speaker. Me. Uh, uh, yes, Andrew, please, it is your turn. Yeah, it's me. Sorry, yes. There. Okay, share my remember. screen. Yes. All right. Share my screen. Thank you. Thank you for will, including yes. me in this in this uh, very uh, good, uh, very good ensemble of uh, people. Thank you very much. Can you see? Can you see this? Uh, just a moment. Yes. 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 All right. Okay. So you're not going. All right. You now, have already is, down, or uploaded your uh, your. Stuff. Well, I know I have 15 minutes, yeah. so I'm going to be able okay. to cover sure, sure, five percent sure. of it out already. And so okay. I'm going to only be able to cover about 40% of this. Fine, no problem. Mm -hmm. Our artificial Kerr Newman black hole can release gravitational waves. And uh, this is a concept talk. And the idea we uh, initiate a model of artificially induced Kerr Newman black holes with specific angular momentum J. And from this model, what would happen to effective charge Q create an E and B field commensurate with the relation with the release of gravitational waves? All right. Um, I'm going to leave out this thing about Apple and other things to sort. Uh, I don't have enough time. And while I will say that this idea, though, is commensurate with the Park 1955 paper of a spinning rod producing gravitational waves, with the provisos about the spinning rod paper, it's artificial. Uh, Kerr Newman black hole will employ the idea of a laser instrumentation of their gravitational wave representation. And uh, I discussed this with a person named Dr. Robert Baker in 2016 with the difference that a B field would be generated and linked to effects linked with the induced spin to the Kerr Newman black hole. So this is, some, this is the concept idea that got in terms of an extended discussion, which I had. All right. Uh, 24 pages of references were removed. I had to do it. Our, uh, our initial statement of this document is to use the Kerr Newman black hole event horizon, which charge Q at a constant angle of momentum J as an induced state of affairs, which will then be utilized as fed by laser induced energy for the generation of gravitational waves and gravitons. A brief cap as far as uh, Kerr Newman uh, black uh, hole physics. DS squared, this is the line. This, these are the basic, uh, this is the basic uh, methodology of a rotating curve. In our consideration, in order to simplify matters that J equaling to a constant, this is for the ease of calculation, at least is A, is a measure of the angle of momentum per mass, and M uh, in equation one is mass, all right? Then you would have, a, 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 then M is the geometric mass, which lead to, a coiloralist type of force of rho phi dot squared, phi, I mean phi double dot, in a, if we identify rho, it's replaced the angular velocity 
angular velocity above is a correlative force as given page 130 of, of the reference. I had to leave the references out. All right. Now, let me just go to this point. What we attain by using a charge Q in a rotating black hole solution. Reference 42 gives extremal conditions. These are the extremal conditions. This is, uh, this is an issue of the S and the entropy. The two parts of equation four can be interpreted by the idea of the infinite quantum statistics. And this is just entropy and mass that you get in terms of the charge and the angular momentum. And what I was able to come up with is M is equal to M, S in particle count. Then you would get that the particle count that you would get would be proportional then to the charge Q4 plus 4 uh, A squared. And you'd have an externally applied uh, temperature, KBT over 2 MC squared. What this would do, this is with respect to laser physics, is you come up with a relationship between the, the induced charge, QKPT applied. This T applied is from a laser. This would be an N, which would be a particle count over pi. The particle count is simulate, stimulates uh, graviton emission from the black hole. The temperature T applied from a laser smash into uh, a target will be uh, influence a uh, effective charge Q. All right, now here's more of it. And calculation of yeah, electromagnetic fields of a current human black hole, how we pick, where we pick a uh, frame of reference where the E field really isn't considered. And this is using a result by Apple itself is, uh, is old, but anyway, the point of the thing is that you can come up with this treatment uh, the B and the E field. One is having that the they equals there are both the E and the B field, but we simplify it further, E plus IB. And what you're able to get is a major simplification. We have a vanishing E field in a situation with the B field with J equals JT, allowing for torque, which shows up all the time in black hole physics. We don't have much spatial variation of, of J. And this is the first order approximation. So anyway, which is, is that here's the charge Q. You would have a, a emission N pi. The T, which you would have the T applied is with respect to uh, applied from a laser. This is an induced charge Q upon a system. This is the external uh, temperature. And then what you're coming up with is that uh, you would have a B field, which would be generated. Now, let me just, uh, let me just, uh, since I'm running out of time, I can say t this is, uh, let me go, comparing our work against uh, the results by quarter as far as the temp effective temperature for a black hole. Dr. Quarter did an explicit uh, quantum physics analogy as to obtaining an effective temperature T for black holes, which has many similarities with our results. One aside, one big difference are temperature T applied and bonds applied upon by an external temperature regime, which you claim would induce conditions for the formation of a current human black hole. Whereas what is done in his reference is assume the black hole leaves the effective temperature of the black hole. So the quarter result involves an indigenous temperature. We're talking about an applied temperature. So that is different. So, which is, is that he applied his result was the count was TE and an entropy, which is two pi N, uh, two pi N uh, plus, you know, this is, uh, this is not what I was using. This is the infinite quantum statistics plus some other terms. And what it is is that his temperature TE was different from mine. So what that I was referring to was to come up with an induced charge Q, an E external, the N would be in terms of emitted particles that you would get, you know, inputted into so this equation 12. And this is the applied. And this analysis right over here. So the question is uh, could you have an indigenous temperature, let's say of a black hole, being equivalent to the applied energy conditions? And uh, 
this is what was brought up by uh, Corda and uh, the result, it's not clear, but it's something that can be looked at. And uh, so what I'm referring to is for laser induced implosions on a black hole, Newman style. And so what you would have is that the laser light and the gravitation wave frequency the emitted would be very high, the 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 12 hertz range. Our working assumption would be the emitted gravitation wave for induced black hole would scale uh, approximately as 2m. And this is what you'd have gravitational waves, and this would be temperature. So you'd have a mass induced, you know, effective mass. And which is what you would like to do is to have conditions in which then that the external uh, temperature, the externally applied temperature could in some cases lead to a uh, relationship to emitted gravitational waves. Now, which is, is that I'm stopping right here because I'm at the very end, I'm the very end guy, and you people have better things to do than listen to me. <laughs> but what I can do is this is an actual 45 page paper. And as people are interested in, I'm going to send it to you, which is, is that uh, rwill9955b at gmail.com. And mm -hmm. it had the full blown uh, derivation of how you could, in certain cases, given certain uh, physical considerations, remove the E field, just talk about a B field applied to the situation. Now, how and why did I come up with this idea? I'm very familiar with what you might call the, uh, the fusion experiments done at Lawrence Livermore Labs. I know, example, uh, Knuckles, you know, Dr. Well, uh, Knuckles, who was the, uh, who was the uh, director of a program about trying to induce what you might call fusion energy. And uh, just as that, I have just really tried to keep in terms of what you might call coming up with a, uh, as I said, uh, here you have, this is a, a, a particle count, which may be related to gravitational waves. This is eternally Explied, uh, externally applied temperature, which is T. And then you would have an effective charge, Q, with respect to the system. And that would also, too, would be related to a, a gravitational wave emission. And the N would be referring to gravitons or equivalent uh, counts of particles, which would be released. Now, which is, is that what you can do if you want to see the paper, it's 45 pages long. Uh, I just, I will send it to you, rwill9955b at gmail.com. I'm going to stop right here because if I don't stop right here is that you people are going to uh, get very irritated. It's quite late where you are. So I want to give everybody a break. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Well, Thank this you. is my basic idea, which was whether you configure the E field, but you had some ways in its Apple and other people came up with a very, very specific way to eliminate, you know, just how to rewrite uh, electromagnetic spectrum radiation to so get E field would essentially really be covered by the way you would describe a B field. But I'm describing an input temperature, which you could get hitting a system, a temperature T from a lasers. And these would be very powerful lasers uh, firing many times. And I talked this over with Knuckles and other people at Lawrence Livermore Lab and some other places. I've talked with them about this procedure and it's actually quite an extensive literature where people tried to do this sort of thing already. So what I'm saying is not unknown. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Questions? Um, I, I hope at least that I got the basic idea across. Did I? Roughly. Yeah. What? It is not, not so easy, not so easy, Andrew. It's not so easy to follow, but anyway. Uh, what? We, we will try to understand more, I mean. It's, yeah. Perfect. Well, Thank you. The idea is to apply the idea is to apply thermal temperatures from a thermally induced temperature from fired lasers 
into mm -hmm. a configuration. This is very similar to what people were doing to try the what you might call controlled fusion experiments. Yes, yes, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the idea would also too to be able to create an induced charge Q, which would be tricky. You understand what I'm saying? The equivalent of an induced charge Q is the equivalent you'd have something like a plasma, which is whirling around and you induce a charge Q in that situation. And you also make some assumptions about the, and you also make some assumptions about what you might call the angular momentum, some other things. And that's what the basic idea was. So I hope that I wasn't too long. I hope I wasn't no, no. too long. I try to keep it focused. What? You, you are in perfect time, Andrew. What? No, no. You, you are, your time is perfect. You are not uh, yet completed. If, if, so I didn't time. abuse your time slot. No, absolu absolutely. Absolutely. What? Oh, fine. Oh, fine. Mm. Thank you very much. Okay. And I also apologize for a thing, you know, when I was talking to you about Gary, but Gary was stuck up because he was going to be going to, he's going to be going to uh, Italy and he's going to try to give his presentation on a laptop. And I said, my God, he's not going to be able to get his talk. Mm -hmm. and I said, you know, he didn't deserve this. And mm -hmm. secondly, too, was was that I did manage to get my thing done was cons. But as I said, the thing which was with a yeah, I was talking about Bose Einstein condensates, BECs, and uh, essentially, you know, the last talk, BECs and everything, sorry. Because I talked about Bose Einstein condensate for gravitons for a uh, very small black holes, and I was applying that to a situation with respect to a uh, cosmology question. So anyway, it was very amusing, but I mm -hmm. want to thank you for the fact that you allowed me to, what you might call to help Gary out. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not the center of the universe, Angela. No, of course. But mm -hmm. anyway, what I would do is I will send you, I will send you a very rigorously stated version of everything I talked about glancing. So you can decide what to do with it about conference proceedings. But I said it won't, as I said, I have over 45 pages written out on this already. I already um, removed almost all of it and what I presented here. Yeah, I think, I think, I don't know. Um, anyway, you have to look in the procedure. Well, she wanted a big fat one. I said, I can still manage to keep within 20 pages, but it, it's, it's actually quite a lot in there. Okay, mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. God bless you. And I hope that you're... Uh, I hope that your uh, staff has a wonderful next few days of Marcel Crossman. <laughs> I'm going to sit, be lazy, and I'm just going to just watch what you might call people talk without doing any work. <laughs> I'm a Thank lazy you. old man. You saw what I looked like several years ago. I'm a lazy old man. I like to be able to sit back and just to watch. <laughs> So, thank you. So, that's all I'll just say is that you had you had a marvelous selection of speakers. I want to say thank you. Your speakers were excellent. I just want to thank you so much. It was quite a treat. I didn't necessarily I had so many people on Tuesday I couldn't listen to it, but then I saw the tape, you know, the the the, the recordings. I went over the recordings and I heard every single talk on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll do the same thing this at this one. So as I said, I'll try to write something that's not insane for the conference proceeding. So you have some fun with it and maybe someone can do something about it. But I'm telling you where the idea came from. It came from a discussion I had with Knuckles. Mm -hmm. And other okay. was, uh, was a fusion implosion experiments. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Welcome, welcome. All right. You have a good so, you have a good evening. Thank you. Well, right. if uh, there are questions, please. All right, take care. Uh, otherwise, we can uh, right. come. Okay. Any questions? I think we can close the, the section. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the contribution. And uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>